Mulweni. Hello everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari where we're coming to you live from the Amakala Game Reserve down in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa. And what a wonderful way to start the show with a nice big bull giraffe with a very young, young one as well. I'm sure he's only a couple of months old. But my name is Ralph Kirsten and on the camera I've got Morgan. That's him indeed. Welcome aboard the largest and greatest game drive in the world. What does the bush hold in store for us today? Well, you'll have to sit back, relax and watch, wait and see. For now, we're just enjoying the giraffe. It's a tower. There's a few of them moving around. The cow, who I assume is the mother of that calf, just moved off uh, just before we started the show. But um, I'm not quite sure who the father is. Well, uh, we can actually see the umbilical cord that is uh, looking like an old piece of biltong on its belly. So it, that's why I say it can't be more than a few months old. And nice to see fresh new life on the reserve. And it's been rather cold today, so it's nice that the sun has now come peeking through the clouds. But it does still seem to be coming and going. Anyway, we'll be out and about. We'll probably go and see what else we can find after this nice little sighting with this group or journey of giraffe. And as always, please don't forget that this is a live and interactive experience. So we'd love for you to jump on board with us and send us through your questions and your comments. And you can do that by going on the Wild Earth website and registering. And first up, Linda Poli, it's lovely to have you on board with us and hello and good afternoon to you too. Three in a row, small, medium and large. We've got that youngster, looks like a cow just behind or maybe is that a young bull, I'm not quite sure. And then a lovely big bull with the darker sort of leopard-like spots at the back. That's where they Latin or scientific name comes from Camelopardus, the camel with the leopard spots. And you can see why. So, this being the southern giraffe, and we do obviously see much bigger giraffe on the live at the waterhole show, that being the Maasai. But anyway, the wind coming through now and quite a bit of clouds as well. I'm hoping there won't be any rain today. We'll cross our fingers and our toes. But that being said, let's go and have a look what the weather's going to be like across all the different locations. Well, it certainly is beautiful, hot weather. It was just very hot to be on game drive at this stage of the day. But anyway, it will be all right. It will cool down. At least there's a bit of a breeze and we know that the sun is starting to dip already. So that will be fine. Anyway, my name is Tristan. On camera, I've got Rian. Rian, you surviving on the back there? A bit hot. A bit hot. That's all right. Better hot than cold, that's what I always say. Anyway, we've got a waterbuck bull that is just sitting behind Gauri Dam wall at the moment. It's a beautiful specimen, um, nice and dark in coloration with beautiful horns. Um, there's lots of these guys around in this particular area. They like all these water points that we have in the sand, so quite common to see big waterbuck bulls around, but they're always such impressive animals. I think they don't get as much credit as something like a kudu because they don't have that spiraled horn, but um, I still like the shape of their horns. And He's actually looking a little bit mangy, sadly, or is it just a shadow? I think it's just the shadows. Ah, it looked like mange at first, but it's just the way the shadow was hitting him. Um, this time of the year we do start to see mange coming through a little bit on some of the animals as it starts to get dry. They, the mite starts to proliferate and, and start to get these patches on things like kudu particularly. Um, but yeah, every now and then you'll see it on something like waterbuck. But I think it was just the shade and the way it was hitting. Now while we were sitting with this waterbuck bull, I also heard a greater honey guide calling quite close. I'm going to try to see if I can find it. They're quite pretty little birds and they have a very cool call. 
and as the name suggests, can be followed to honey. Um, it, does, it actually does work sometimes. I just haven't done it in a long time and it requires quite a lot of patience and you need to be on foot. It's coiling again now. You won't hear it, I don't think. It's uh, quite far away. Isaac, you say hello. How's everyone doing? Everyone is fine on this side of the world. Hopefully everyone else at home is also good. Um, Cedric seems to be in fine spirits this afternoon, given that he's going on leave finally. Um, and we're both hoping for a, a really good finish to our little respective stints. Um, I think probably the plan is for him to go and just follow up around to the Trias, Twindam area. Um, maybe get lucky with those female tracks that he had this morning, so maybe Tlalamba will pop out somewhere. Now I'm going to go and try and see if I can find Marip. So I was trying to explain to Sid where it was, but it's just such a difficult area that to send him. There's going to be like needle in a haystack. At least I know exactly where the last position was. So it'll be a, <clears throat> still going to be difficult for us, but it'll be easier in some respects because I kind of know which way he was walking and where exactly the last view of him was. We did try after we lost him this morning to go round and we got round, but where he went down was just very difficult to get visual and given that we had spent quite a lot of time with him in the morning it just didn't seem like the right thing to try and go crashing through there and unsettle him um, he was looking for a place to, to lie down so we just leave him there and then try again this afternoon but it's going to take a whole lot of luck for us to get him again um, that block is not easy there's lots of places he can lie down there's thick um, dense quarry um, bushes and there's also a lot of long grass and three different drainage lines so it's going to take a bit of a, a look, but what I'm going to first do is head off to Biffles Hook Dam, just go and check if there's anything there, and then I'm going to come back and start looking for Mareeps in earnest. All right, while I go and do all of that, let's send you across to Rexon, who's up at Pridelands, um, and let's see how his afternoon is going and what his plans are for today. Good afternoon, good afternoon everyone joining us in a beautiful afternoon, very hot here, Proudland Eco Training Safari Life. We are going to start our show with the wool neck stock. Unbelievable, it's really amazing. From myself, Rexin, and BK behind the camera, we are looking for a great afternoon. We will be hopping from one waterfall to another, but we believe that uh, it will be very much productive in this waterhole. We come to the northern side of the dam, of course, where we benefit wool neck stock. Bottom on the wool neck stock, there's um, a mud that's drying up. There's a kind of uh, area where elephant likes to wallow quite a lot. There's wool neck stock, remember, they move from one waterhole to another, more especially where the water is getting low, because they might get quite a lot of uh, all uh, species that lives inside water, inside water, it could be amphibians, it could be fish, it could be anything. So they are trying to benefit out of that. We'll next talk. As far as I know, the net territorial, <clears throat> there are species that move from one area to another. It makes very sense, and they are monogamous. Of course, it's really interesting. All the time you find the two pairs that move together. If they do happen. They might like to uh, prefer the area, but due to that, you tend to see them. They'll go wherever it's food all the time. They'll move from one water hole to another. They cannot be selective and live in, pet in, in certain areas. So they tend to be going where they know that they will benefit food. That is a second uh, wool neck stock. <clears throat> it could be male and female here involved. And they breed. Most of the time they do lay eggs. Very interesting if you look at the eggs info, I mean, the nest information. Most cases, big eagles and stocks. In most cases, when they do lay eggs, hash three youngster, you might find that maybe two or one survive. It's all about survival of the fittest. But I've seen where a woolen neck stock have three chicks and raise them to success, I mean, successfully. Hello and thank you for joining us for the afternoon. Grace, I mean, it's really commenting on the starting of our show, which is beautiful. We started with Woolly Neck Stock. It's very rare to catch a Woolly Neck Stock on the, on the camera. Of course, 
you tend to see quite a lot of uh, look at that unbelievable yes my favorite animal dwarf mongoose this species honest speaking if we talk about animal that uh, really know how to hunt and successful it's all about uh, the dwarf mongoose very successful very very successful. sometimes they are vulnerable from the uh, bed of prey if they see Uru next to there they might not even associate, associate that uh, is not uh, an eagle they all the time try to be in a thicket where it's not easy to be spotted by a bed of prey of course because they might uh, get killed but uh, they are so amazing the dwarf mongoose they work in numbers very social and when they hunt they all pass the pate unbelievable but these guys the wool next talk you tend to see them in summer did you hear the schools are out yep it's time for the school holidays and wild earth is celebrating with special content just for kids join us from the 21st to the 25th of august for five days of fun our guides will be taking on a number of survival tasks and together we'll learn how to survive in the wilderness, build things and have fun in the wild too. Wild Earth Kids, it's in your nature. What are we talking about? You can see the puddle of water down there. Uh, it is really tried to fish around. It, it is time now uh, for these guys to uh, really benefit in this area. Of course, elephant will come. Uh, I'm happy because we're here. If a head of elephant comes, this is the first area that they like the most because they will stir the mud and try to cool down the body system. And just because of that, uh, activities of an elephant when the elephant moves because it's very muddy everything that's the if it's a fish it really do not get must much oxygen it will float in the water these guys it will be in business to to feed themselves during drought season there's two species that benefit a bed of prey and the carnivores in most cases because less water and uh, less healthiness from all different species and they're able to hunt and successful. You can see how they hunt. Use the pick.
Yes, well, it is a very, very hot afternoon here at uh, Juma, and I am just heading to a few of the water holes here on the southern side. But first of all, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cedric, and uh, behind the camera with me on uh, Wendy, we've got Muscles and Paul. So, yes, thanks for joining us on our Sunset Safari. All right, while I'm coming here, I know Twin Dams. I've been very fortunate at Twin Dams for the last few days on these hot days having a lot of elephants coming down uh, for a drink and uh, some nice bird action as well. So I think Twin Dams to me is going to be the winner for this afternoon. Um, but as well, I might be also following up on that female leopard tracks coming north between this road, Weaver's Nest and Twin Dams, that's to the further uh, to the east of me. And she came into this block. So maybe she turned towards uh, Twin Dams. So yes, let's see what we find around that side. But uh, I am looking forward to my last uh, drive before I go and leave. I'm sure Tristan as well. So I think Tristan and myself, we are going to really look out for uh, at least some rosettes before we uh, jump into our vehicles and leave the reserve. Debbie, yes, uh, me too. I remember my last, uh, my last drive from my last stint. We found, uh, where did we find? Oh, it was actually on the last day. We got Tavangumi, Marips, and I think it was Lalamba. We found those three on my last day. So let's see if I'm going to get some leopard luck this afternoon. I'm hoping that uh, Tristan as well makes uh, a nice find somewhere around. Gotta go pan, gotta go shortcut. We left uh, that beautiful young male leopard this morning. So, let the search begin. But also looking for some other nice interesting things, as always. As always. You never know what you're going to find around the corner. Let's make it a good one. But wow, what a hot day. It's about 37. 38 today. It's proper. Dream World, yes, I think it's a good plan. That's all I said. This, this is just a section here. Um, I also had an update about uh, another female leopard called Langa that she crossed a little bit further west from where we are on another road called Shibamu. She crossed into that side, um, but we didn't find really any tracks this morning. But we'll keep our eyes open. So. I'm going to really look around, yeah. But yeah, what will really put a cherry on the cake for this afternoon or for tonight, especially if we can find uh, old Shadulu and the cub, oh, I will be very happy on my last drive. It will be amazing just to find that uh, leopardess and her cub. But let's see. Let's wait and see. I might just make a turn at the hyena den a little bit later. Way too hot now to go to the hyena den. Way too hot. So I think I will do that once it starts cooling down. I'm going to pop my nose in there just to see if I'm going to get at least lucky with one hyena. There's one. I'll be very happy. I know June's cub was up to, out this morning, but mom wasn't around, so we couldn't... We're not allowed to remain at the den site if there's no adults around because Ntima's got her cub as well, or cubs, or cub. So, um, yeah, we have to have an adult in the vicinity of that den site to stay there and view them. All right, well, we're going to head down towards uh, Twin Dams. Let's head over to Rexon in a Pridelands as he's got those beautiful woolly neck stalks. Yes, yes, just there. Behind it. Great. Uh, we are having other uh, visitors here at this part, uh, part of the water where it looks like all the species that... Um, I uh, hear yeah, a busy hunting. There's, um, oh, I mean, woolly neck stock and there's a hammer cop. Both of them, you can see from the behind, I'm not sure what the position here, back more towards the west of this uh, woolly neck. The hammer cop, yes, they're moving somewhere there. Unbelievable. 
it's it's very brown sort of an animal difficult to see it's really blending well with the environment but hamakop it called lightning bird in the shangan or zulu they call it lightning bird they associate the species with lightning the african people with my own tribes they associate the species one of the strongest uh, species of bird that we have we all respect all there you can see the nest of hamakop is always uh, respected in our culture because these animals have a very good symbiotic relationship with uh, snakes, especially black mambas. They can live together in the same nest. It's nothing that can really uh, she have to get to fear. A mamba will have uh, free uh, light. I mean, sort of uh, accommodation. Don't come in and guard on the nest itself. Let's take this opportunity from the hammercop. Join Ralph, the beautiful head of elephant. Folks, this was one of my wish lists yesterday when we got going was to find the breeding herd with the new little youngsters. And that's exactly what we've been able to find. And that youngster was playing on the road. I just had a head shake from one of the females here. It's just uh, letting me know that I mustn't encroach too much closer on their space. I've come up nice and slowly, so showing them all the respect that is due. And we're just going to sit here nice and quietly and watch this herd. We're, we're sort of in the area of the dune forest, so on this western side of the reserve it can be quite difficult because it's very thick and so once the elephants do go into these blocks it's quite difficult to see them but we've managed to find them uh, in and around the road so I think some have crossed and there's still lots more of them that are due to cross so we're here nice and early and at the perfect time there was one of the bulls that I saw with one of his tusks that has been broken off and that was uh, done by the dominant bull um, called Koli and um, so that was either Izika or Afstert I didn't quite see um, if he didn't have a tail or not I think because of where it was broken off that you could actually still see a little bit of the tusk I think that's indeed Afstert uh, Izika I think had his tusk broken off right inside uh, you know inside the skin so you there's no tusk left but regardless, it's just uh, always a joy being so close to elephants. The wisdom that they hold, I always think of. Billy, I'm glad you're on board and I'm glad that you're happy to see Amakala again. Especially one of my favorite animals, Loxodonta africana. very special indeed did you know that the wild earth team makes weekly behind the safari content <laughs> would you like to get to know the wild earth family better <laughs> see how we live this is eagle's bedroom learn about our production process and see the antics that happen off camera. <laughs> Sign up to be an explorer and you will get access to all this content and more.
become a skilled safari guide, traversing the African bush and encountering wild animals up close. Whether you're a retiree, a recent graduate, or a professional seeking a change, the 55-day eco-training program is for you. This comprehensive course will provide you with an unparalleled opportunity to gain expertise in every aspect of the African bush. With the coaching of experienced training guides, you'll embark on an unforgettable adventure that will give you a deep understanding of wildlife, conservation and African cultures. Over the course of the program, you'll learn essential skills such as animal tracking, bird identification and bush survival techniques. But the benefits of this rigorous training go far beyond technical knowledge. You'll also form close bonds with fellow nature enthusiasts and conservationists from around the world, creating a global network of like-minded individuals. Your days will be filled with excitement and wonder as you observe animals in their natural habitats and explore the diverse landscapes of Africa. Return home with newfound knowledge, a qualification, unforgettable memories and a sense of accomplishment that will last a lifetime. All right, well, we're at uh, Twin Dams. Unfortunately, we haven't had our luck this afternoon, as of yet, around the water holes. I really thought we might get some elephants or buffalo or just something coming down here for a drink this afternoon. It's a hot afternoon, but so far, nothing. But we've got this beautiful tree, of course, with all the old weaver nests that's busy hanging. And very soon, I think in the next uh, month or so, all the little weavers will start coming back again. So preparing their nests. So what they'll do, they'll start breaking those old nests apart. And once they break those old nests apart, then they will start reconstructing new ones. It's amazing how they get that right. And there was a study done with weavers. They wanted to see if it's instinctual or was it do the birds actually learn from the adults on how to weave those nests. So what they did, they took to different weavers, I think it was like a red-headed weaver and a normal marsh weaver, and in a because they got different shape uh, nests, and they brought them up from chicks, they brought them up to adulthood, and uh, pretty much had them in an aviary, and had the whole thing going, and then they weaved their nests for the female, the males, and uh, the shape was exactly the same as for that species of weaver. It just shows you very much instinctual, built in to their, to their system on knowing that they have to weave that specific shape for that specific species. Amazing. And we've had some nice red-headed weavers here before, I think a little bit further east from where we are now. It's also got very much this uh, oval-shaped nest but what's nice about a red of weaver, it's got a long funnel, like a long entrance to the nest. All right, well, we're going to start moving on from this side. Let's head over to Tristan. Well, we've come to Buffalo Dam. That's, like I said, just going to do a little bumble up here just for a bit um, before we go and start looking for my reaps in earnest. And there's a big giraffe, a bull that's here, um, feeding at the moment, as they often do at this time of the day. Um, I think it had already drank by the time we got here. I was looking, trying to see if I could see if it drank. The tracks come right to where there's a little bay where the elephants often drink. So. I suspect that it was enjoying drinking there. It looks like it was feeding off a buffalo thorn. Now oh, it's changed trees. Um, as we know with these trees is that they do start to produce tannins and that obviously makes the tree bitter and so that's why the giraffe doesn't stay on the same tree all the time. Um, as it's eating so the leaf starts to become less and less desirable and so the giraffe then will move to the next one. Now what's interesting with that is that a lot of the, well, initially it was thought that the pheromones were released via the leaf and carried by the wind um, to the next tree. 
and that next tree would be able to start producing um, tannins to try and defend itself but actually what a lot of it is from is from the network of roots underneath the surface of the ground so the trees actually talk to them each other via this network of roots so each root touching the other root will be able to tell them look I'm under attack you need to start producing these tannins um, and that immediate area will all start to do it and what that then means is that giraffe can feed off a few trees within that section and then they've got to move off and it's a clever thing because ultimately even though it's probably not great for the giraffe that thinks to themselves well I found something delicious but now I've got to move off is that it stops the giraffe from overeating on that tree if a giraffe was to strip an entire tree of all of the leaves then photosynthesis becomes very very difficult and there's a possibility of the tree dying and so what this does is it means that the giraffe move off and then they come back and move off and come back and that gives the time for the tree to rejuvenate new leaves to grow um, you must remember that these guys eat very specific um, trees they like trees with lots and lots of nutrients and so it's a clever clever system it means that these guys are not exhausting their resources and the tree itself is also surviving just love watching them with their long tongues every now and then you'll just see the tongue coming out and wrapping around these little branches and pulling all these leaflets off I'm actually surprised we haven't seen more giraffe um, there's a lot of knob thorns that still have flowers on them and giraffe absolutely love knob thorn flowers they like to feed off them in fact if you look across the dam to the left of this giraffe there's a knob, th a knob thorn in full flower at the moment uh, and they are full of nectar and often we find the giraffe if they can reach them feeding on those flowers and their mouths go all yellow from the pollen um, as they feed so that particular tree there but I suspect that they can't reach those top flowers um, if I look at the lower branches of that tree all the flowers are missing so it's got a browse line on it which is probably the height that the giraffe can actually reach and the rest of the flowers on top again it's a nice thing when you get mature knob thorns is that they are able to flower and then new ones start to be produced um, they can be pollinated the problem is is that a lot of these mature knob thorns are targeted by elephants quite heavily um, they strip the bark quite a lot of these guys so we don't see as many mature knob thorns as we used to and knob thorn used to be a pretty common sight in this part of the world and it's starting to get less and less I actually saw a crazy set of photographs um, from central Kruger where we have knob thorn woodlands and it was I can't remember what the time span was but it wasn't long it was like 25 years or 30 years somewhere along that, that line and it was a photograph, like sets of photographs taken from the same spot um, 25 years before, 30 years before. And it's amazing to see how it's been deforested by the increased number of elephant. Um, you can see that there's a massive, massive reduction in mature knobthorn woodland in those areas. And the problem with that then is there's a huge knock-on effect that takes place. It's not just obviously the trees that are getting destroyed but knob thorns are actually a vitally important tree in those parts of of the Kruger as nesting trees for white-headed vulture particularly um, they like to nest right on top but obviously the whitebacks also use it um, hooded not so much uh, and and not so much with the capes but the the lappet faced also would use the top of a, a knob thorn so it's pretty pretty sad that's that's the case and I mean eventually something will have to be done about it. Um, Lindy you say it's pretty incredible that trees can communicate via their roots it is amazing isn't it um, everyone always thinks that trees are just these inanimate objects that sit here and don't really do anything but trees can most certainly talk and they are most certainly in communication with each other all the time um, there's even very cool um, books on mother trees so trees that will give nutrients from themselves especially in big forested areas so big tall trees that give nutrients to saplings that are down on the ground that don't get enough light in order to get those trees to grow and to become up through the forest and then be able to access the light and so there's a lot of talk at the moment particularly in a forest in the UK where they've removed these mother trees obviously through deforestation and the whole forest is dying so these little saplings are not getting the nutrients from the mother trees and are actually starting to die which is, is hugely sad um, and hopefully something will be done about it and 
they can end up kind of sorting out the problems with that. Um, this giraffe has obviously just disappeared behind a bush for now. It gives you an idea of their camouflage. You can see how that spotted pattern really just breaks up the outline of this animal and so yes we know there's a giraffe there because we saw it go around the corner but it could easily easily be missed if you were looking at it like that now and moving you might miss that animal Tammy I suspect this must be coming off the back of this giraffe that was born in I think it's Pennsylvania in a zoo um, this giraffe that's got no spots on it so it's just a solid beige color um, and so has, the, the question is has there been have I ever seen any giraffe born or heard of any giraffe born in the wild with that coloration so the answer is from personally no I've never seen um, one of that color um, so it's basically the dark coloration of a giraffe the whole body so there's not those light sort of veins that run through the panels on a giraffe skin um, so I've never seen that and I've never seen photographs of it in the wild uh, there are photographs of leucistic giraffe, um, gir very very dark, almost black giraffe, but never that co solid coloration that you see there. Now, I don't know the entire story. I just saw a photo of it. Uh, I didn't actually go and read the whole article, but potentially, I mean, it's it's obviously possible that these kind of um, recessive genes can flow through animals, and you can get these things, but. A lot of the time those kind of things, particularly when the coloration is the same and it's not an extreme white or extreme black, um, that can be due to potentially um, inbreeding of those animals. I'm not saying that that's the case with those ones, like I said I haven't read it and it would be very unfair for me to say that it is, but just I know that sometimes inbreeding can cause these weird color morphs. Um, and we know within zoos that sometimes you know, the zoo stock can be a bit tricky. So, although a lot of the sort of better zoos are very, very, very careful with what they breed and how they breed it. Anyway, right, moving on. I think we'll probably leave Bufalzuk Dam and leave this giraffe that's now hidden and go and see what else we can find. Stay up to date with the latest happenings at Wild Earth. Discover what goes on behind the scenes and get a weekly recap of the best moments on the channel. He's got it, he's got it! And he's straight up a tree! Sign up to be an explorer and receive our newsletter written just for you and sent straight to your inbox every week. Wild Earth Explorers, a club for people who are passionate about nature. Thank you for joining us and have a fantastic morning.
good hunting fisher. Be very, very, very dangerous. So you've got to just be a little careful on days like today. This wind, I think, should shift through the night if I look at the temperatures and start to then push from the southeast. Um, well, actually, a little bit more southwest, funny enough. Um, and then a cold uh, sort of frontal system should come in. It's not cold, cold, but it's definitely cooler than it is today. Um, but when it's blowing like this, you've just got to be aware of it and just be very, very careful. Hot fires are, are super tricky because they can really get into everywhere and they are capable of catching or starting to light things like leadwoods and that's the last thing you want because leadwoods if they start to burn particularly if they start to get in underneath and internally um, that can be weeks that those trees burn for and then you know another big wind like this kicks it up again and it starts so we just need to be careful I'm sure all the lodges will know we get a, a fire index um, well they used to I don't know if they still do but there's a a manager of the Sabi Sands in any of the camps, you get a, a daily fire index. It's got like a green, yellow, and red system on it um, with, a, with a scale. It'll tell you what that index is for the day and how bad it is and whether or not fire should be, be used. And obviously in lodges, it's quite important because a lot of the lodges at night have lanterns and fires and, and those kinds of things. So it's just designed to try and keep everybody as safe as possible. And the fuel load at the moment is so high, you know, after all the rains, the fact that Bifflesook Dam is as full as it is at this time of the year, um, gives you an idea that we've had really good rains. And so what that means is that we get a huge amount of um, growth of grass. So everywhere has got nice thick grass growing. I mean, you look at even on the banks of, of Bifflesook Dam, uh, there's like a little sort of section that juts out where the hippo is. That section there, some of you might remember, if you go back to 2017, 2018, or 2016, 17, 18, that section there, Tingana used to sit there a lot, and there's lots of footage of him with like buffalo herds coming down in the background, and it's completely clear on that little point, whereas now you can see quite thick grass and vegetation, and that's the case all the way through the reserve. So when you get a fire running with that kind of fuel load, plus all the pushed over trees from that drought period, from the elephants, it's just a lot of mass that can burn um, so high fuel load hot wind creates a very 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 intense hot fire which scorches everything it can also be very bad for the soil it can often scorch the seed layer um, so you know, you've got to be a bit careful on a day like today but if you're a hippo and a giraffe right now you don't have to worry about those things at this stage of the game because there's no fire in the area Maxine, and it's a good thing to hear about. Uh, you know, obviously out here we talk a lot about animals particularly. Um, so mammals and birds really kind of get the main focus. But things like fires and, and floods are, are super important to discuss. Uh, and their roles within an ecosystem. And every ecosystem, fire plays an important role. Um, we as humans, unfortunately, we have to tinker a little bit with it um, in order to create sustainable um, commercial enterprises. Um, as well as to keep people safe, so not just within game reserves. Um, you know, fires are stomped out or put out, um, even if they're natural, just to try and protect people as much as they can. And obviously in game reserves like this, there is an element that if, let's say, a natural wildfire started out from a lightning strike and it burnt half of Kruger, it's going to be a major, major issue. There's going to be a huge loss in revenue because people can't come to lodges if there's no lodge and there's no animals. Um, and so then the area itself obviously doesn't get looked after. Then you've got, you know, reduced funding for anti-poaching, all these kind of things. And so it's really just a bad thing all around. So to understand fire and how it moves is a very, very important part of how we kind of manage these areas and keep all of these things working. Right, we're going to now move on from Buffalo Dam. We've had a good view of our giraffe. In the meantime, let's send you across to Rex and see how he's going. Great, thank you so much from Tristan. We are here at um, Andlovo Dam. We have this uh, woolen neck stock. You can see that white color. Anything in the world that have white bright color or any color that it we so much exposed to, shining or white red, they can able to see colors. It's amazing to see like that way. We tend to see quite a lot, even some of species that don't 
have colored, but they have maybe a red beak, which is reddish, uh, more shining and beautiful. Oh, look at that. Blacksmith's plover that joins in the party and looking for food. It's amazing because here we're just sitting right here at Mbike. We start to see my first time to see a woodland kingfisher, which is right next to us. A brown headed woodland kingfisher. The kingfishers are amazing species. Look at that. Look like a strap, but uh, look like a brown hooded kingfisher. Yes. Unbelievable. These guys they have an ability even hunting inside water. It's true that the, the species they have that experience even fishing or fish around. Doesn't matter. All the kingfishers. If you look at the way they really dive in the water, it's such amazing. If anything dies, anything shows an opportunity as fish, they can take it. But most of them they do for insect. And the reason behind that, if I read or follow up my history background of my experience as a guide, the kingfishers, all of them, they used to fish in the area. Since in 1980s, 1980, where there was a huge drought, you tend to see that uh, all fish were dying in water. When the rain comes, the population of fish was very low in certain areas. Then these guys, they switched to hunt to insect because they have that ability and experience hunting insect. That's the reason today they're common. We tend to see them in area where they live. They adapt to live in that particular area. So if someone tells you that I've seen kingfisher, a brown-headed kingfisher fishing or killing fish, yes, of course, it does happen. But in majority in areas where we are experienced, as like myself, I, I come up, I grew up in sense where most of the time these guys, they show ability of hunting insect the most. If you've never been in an area where they hunt fish, you would never ever know. So all species, it's the same as lion, leopard, elephant. In different areas, they adapt different lifestyle that they can survive according to the environment of that particular area where they might be. I'll take an example, a leopard that lives in townships. You tend to see them, they hunt mice and other stuff that are small. And they survive with that. Some of them, of course, they've been there for years and years. They hunt with some scrub hair, something small, and they're able to, I mean, live longer. Leopards in sands, leopards in the Greater Kogan National Park, they hunt impala. Some of them, they hunt kudu. If you never come across leopard hunting kudu, you never know. It depends what is more populated in the area of a leopard or lion that is living. That's the reason you might find even leopard or lions that are living in, in other part of the National Park. They cannot hunt buffalo because they grew up in the family in a certain area where they hunt only impala. They don't know how to hunt big animals and they're not interested because they're brought up by hunting specific animal that uh, it really uh, overpopulated in or found in the location where they come from. From the Hoodland Kingfisher at Pride and Echo Training Safari Life, there's John Ralph with the breeding head of elephant. Great, uh, let's uh, apology there. We will be continuing looking around here to see what might be coming. Oh, look at that. Such amazing. The color of these uh, wool neck stalk, it's really amazing. It's not pure black if, black. if you look at by my naked eyes, at the back it's like a navy sort of color, but dark looking shape. Similar with the um, Bachelor Starlings, which they have that shining sort of uh, color, but uh, not pure black. You, you, you pick uh, a color as the sun reflect on the animal itself. Cute looking species. Most of the stock around in the area, believe me that uh, they are endangered. If you look at the woolly neck stock, if you look at... Tom is also commenting about coloration at the back of the species. Yes, Tom 
It's unbelievable. My first time getting so close to Woolen next to over many years and able to see all these details. Such amazing here and it's unbelievable. Most of our stock around in the area that are endangered. If you look at uh, the settlable stock, they are very endangered. If you look at uh, um, spoon bowl, they are also endangered. Quite few of them. The reason behind that in many cases around in the park, early days, farmers that used to around in the area, they had a problem with the jackals, hyena, killing sheep and goats. So sometimes if it happens that a jackal have killed something, they will poison the carcass. When these guys get into those areas and able to eat, they will die. Is how actually many of them they get killed like that way around in area, most of the areas. Remember those days people used to farm here, not in, in conservation. Is how actually the species get to be killed. Look at that. Beautiful. You can see the reason why they call it woolly next door. You can see on the neck itself, it's not become obvious. Those heads look like a wool that's been cut in pieces and stick with the glue. That's the reason I oh, find something there. I don't know what it might be. Look like a, a frog. How oh, lucky. Most of these guys, if they are having healthy milk, you will see with the crop. The crop will start to be swollen if they fall. That tells you that wherever they might come from, they're very successful on their daily hunt. Sometimes uh, in the right time of the year where they're fishing and all that, I've seen quite a lot of uh, species of birds like marable stock that likes flying of big fish holding my most special catfish and they can swallow that. Sometimes it's very challenging to see uh, a, a, I mean, marable stock swallowing a big catfish like that, even stick out and regurgitate and start again. It, it's really a mission. Beautiful. Hammer cop. The word it derived from the head shape. The head shapes look like a hammer. That's the reason they call it hammer cop. In Shangan, they call it tekwani, or in Zulu, means tekwani. That means the species itself, it does have magic. Let's see if they can present uh, today their magic that normally. Get ready for your daily dose of African wildlife magic. Be enchanted by the intimate moments shared by the animals as they drink, play and interact in their natural habitat. With our daily wildlife videos, you'll experience the thrill of safari adventures without ever having to leave your seat. Let the wild adventure unfold right before your eyes. Africam. Always live, always wild.
So what you're gonna see there is uh, a bush. There was a lion there, but he's no longer there. He's gone on. So it's quite interesting because we came looking for lions. We found elephants and the lions were right near to the elephants. But um, yeah, I don't have any evidence of the lions for now. So um, we're gonna have to try and get up. It, it's uh, the, the way that the lions moved this morning they um, they headed on to the western side and we did have a lovely sighting of them this morning and they've just kept on going. I wonder if they are looking for the cheetah. I'm not quite sure. So I do apologize for just showing you the wind in the bushes, but we will catch up with these guys uh, in a little while. I'm just waiting to see if one of them does pop out. Um, Right, I'm going to be starting up and driving ahead. So enjoy the bumble with me as we head to try and find these lions. They are in here. So as I was saying, these lions are somewhere, but it's, uh, it's something else, this Eastern Cape brush. And so we'll just have to, as uh, we're not allowed to drive off-road in any way whatsoever here, except if we're just turning around. So we've just got to try and anticipate where these lions are moving. We're right on the boundary, on the fence line now, and they're moving up in this direction. So. We'll just carry on going and see if they pop out. That's the best we can hope for. I think I see the male over there, but he's behind the females and the cubs. He's often just following in behind the females. He's just waiting for his lunch. Now, he was looking for breakfast. I don't think he got any. So he's closely behind. Either that or they are going in search of these. Can I have a look at the bush here? Right, so if you give us a chance to try and get ahead here and see if we can find these lines, I'm uh, going to head you to Rexon in the meantime. Great, uh, beautiful. We're just trying to check, as you can see, there's a woodland. Uh, um, there's a, I mean, woodland, woodpecker here. I just saw the woodland kingfisher take off. The woodpecker, it's very uh, difficult to to see which one. It is, look like a golden tail, short tail, and it's very dark on my side, but all this is behind. This is one of the species that, uh, it does for me the lucky charms. Early in the morning, if I had the wood um, woodpecker, of course, it tells me that uh, if you do that song, yeah, like uh, excited voice, it tells you that today it will be good for you. There's a lot of things that you might uh, see. So I'll drive out in the morning with confidence and pride that the day is going to be a great day for us around there. It do work because it comes from the history of uh, the Shanghai tribe, which has been existing from six to eight hundred years, so it passed on to the generation to the next over many years. So something that highly respected by the tribes, of course. Indeed, we pass this to the next generation. Our children know it is. It's in our blood. It's in our as Shanghai uh, culture. It's our culture, of course. This is something that uh, I really respect. Even right here, had it uh, saying. That uh, lovely, excited. Time, thank you for joining us. Yes, indeed, we appreciate it. Um, it is in, in our nature as Shanghai tribes. We, we, we read quite a lot on the nature. On nature, we read an article 
article of nature is very simple because it's something that uh, practically you have to learn and able to really witness as it was just say, I mean giving that uh, lovely kind of uh, a thing the elephant appears we start to really meet our demand that we want that's raising yes let me uh, really position ourselves according to the elephant we have two elephants that uh, really approach I believe that uh, it will be nice to see this elephant in inside water wow and we go back the old bulls this is the uh, males that hangs around more a lot in the camp we're all familiar with this boy he's called half trunk he's one of the elephant if i'm not miss half trunk if it's not him he might be similar but it looks like here uh, him let me try to check yeah, I see. Mopo doesn't like this elephant. Telling him about uh, half trunk, yeah, he will cry. He won't come in Prideland. He knows that uh, this boy is always love to be in camp all the time. It's amazing. Sometimes understanding the elephant, it needs patient. This is one of the species. It's very intimidating. Of course, if it's close by, especially in human habitat, you never know what's going to do. If you read the history of an elephant, sometimes where elephants were interacting with villages and so forth, this is scary kind of information or stories that happens. So if you read that story and watch the movies like that, you might not be able to accept the elephant coming close by because there's nothing that the elephant can really not destroy. Even our buildings that are here, if elephants get irritated that a uh, human being have interfere and challenge, they can chase you anywhere. If you go to the house, they can destroy the house because there are so much powerful animals. But half trunk Amel is one of the elephants that likes to be in human habit. I believe, that is my belief in most cases. And also, it's more like the experience that I have uh, witnessed with an elephant. Because as guide, we witness different things that we have seen over many years. Some of the story we read, some of them practically we engage. So elephant, most cases, they lack human habitat with reasons. It could be availability of food. Sometimes this elephant likes to be on that area because they prefer to be in human habitat for safety reason all the time. They know that uh, if they in human habitat, is nothing that can challenge them all the time. They're in a supervision of safety all the time. But you tend to see because elephant likes those areas because this is that road tree. They will eat anything that we really prohibit elephant to do so and that it comes to our motions and try to push the elephant or do something but understanding elephant it's in our nature they eat everything whatever they see here and it belongs to them that's the reason you find them they want to push they want to eat everything that sometimes we don't want them to do so but that understanding it's a wild uh, trees they need to eat that amazing uh, this boy must spend most of time inside lodge for the afternoon, especially when water is close by. I believe this time of a day, because they've been collecting food the whole day. They have that uh, room because they are male elephant. They can be have their own time, the leisure time, to be around water. I mean, wallowing and swimming. They have that um, actually in the time that they plan over a day, every day. There's a reason you find young males they like to swim they like to play because they can manage themselves it's not like in a breeding head of an elephant because they has to take care of the youngster Ryan we have seen elephant extend themselves by standing with the uh, behind feet and uh, able to go and extend the trunk yes of course and they can reach where they need to do. But in most cases, it's a waste of energy because these guys are so much powerful. What they do in most cases, they just push whatever it is. Unless if it's a tree that they know that uh, it's very important for uh, in, in their life because it has to keep, especially 
it might treat certain disease. It's not all the trees that you find elephant push them. All these trees that I have, uh, we have here in the area, some of them, they respect. They just go for the branches. Some of them, they dig back. If you find an elephant dig back, he knows that that particular tree is going to die. But most cases, in the elephant, all the trees that are produced, they communicate with the other trees, make influence, host more tenants. Those trees would be pushed, would dig back and killed because they, they are causing trouble. And they can pick that simple easily from the sense of a smile. It's right at the camp. We're not going to be, they try to position ourselves according to the other male that is more to the other side of the camp itself. All trees that the reason why this elephant they prefer the large site, uh, if you look at the canopy of trees that are inside a lot, they provide shadow. For an elephant, there's no way if they're overheated, because elephant they cannot handle heat. Those areas it will be visited, of course, to cool down the body system. It's not all the time that they have to feed. Yes, they might want to feed, but most cases it's time where they need protection from the sun. Because sun, elephant cannot handle heat. We all know that. That's the reason they come down to the water. There's an elephant coming from the other side, approaching to the water hole. It looks like all males that uh, they will be approaching at the water hole. You know that males, most cases, they don't really stay with the females. They do their own thing. You know, just because they cannot uh, stay, it's just a matter of the need to build up the body system. If they do stay with the female, most of the time, they will be really moving far distances because female in body, um, in their body, they're very light. They're not heavy as male. Male, they need to be so gentle when they walk. They don't want to use a lot of energy. They re reserve the energy and all the food that they eat to build up the body system, the nutrition, not to waste. That's the reason they're so slow when they move. They don't want to be like rush in. We have female all the time. They move very fast and they move kilometers far, kilometers, more kilometers than the males they do. It's similar with the buffalo. That's raising the male buffaloes. They don't want to move with the head because they move distances and they need to be moving short distances in order to take care of the, the healthiness in their body system and eat anything that can able to build up the body system easy on that way. Maybe I can move a little bit forward to position ourselves according to uh, where this uh, male elephant going to wallow and drink water. The weather is changing, very interesting. Of course, while we are waiting for this elephant to come, and join us here at the water hole. I'll take you to Ralph, who does have a visual of uh, pride of lions. Well, as luck would have it, we've managed to get into a nice open area and uh, just waited for the lions to come towards us, and that's exactly what they've done. So. It seems like the leader is uh, always the one with the collar on, female-wise. And then uh, we'll see the mother of the cubs coming up behind her. And then we should see the four cubs following on behind mom. And then we should see the male bringing up the rear. And you can see it's very windy as well. but. Uh, well worth the wait and the reward for staring at the bush earlier so this is wonderful they are going to head out and through this open area there were some water buck just nearby thomas yes well it's uh it's always a good 
outcome when you go out looking for something and you manage to find them we knew they were moving in the in this direction earlier this morning and so we wanted to follow up on them we got lucky with the elephants but this was our ultimate goal so lovely to spot them now Chatting around the fire is an ancient practice that has connected humanity for centuries and we want to keep it alive in our modern age. As an explorer, you'll have access to intimate gatherings with our naturalists, fascinating guests and experts where we share knowledge, insights and stories around a crackling fire. Rediscover the power of connection, sign up to be an explorer today and experience the magic of Wild Earth's Fireside Chats. you ever dreamed of experiencing the beauty and wonder of the African bush, but don't have months available for an extensive learning program? Look no further than Eco Training's short experiential courses. Designed for those who yearn for a taste of the wild, these immersive programs will give you an in-depth understanding of the African bush in as little as seven days. You'll be guided by expert trainers who will lead you through the various ecosystems of Africa and teach you essential bush skills. Over the course of the programs, you'll learn about animal behavior, tracking and identification, as well as the intricacies of conservation and African culture. With the guidance of your trainers, you'll have the opportunity to witness wild animals up close and personal in their natural habitats. You'll also make new friends and create lasting connections with people from all over the world who share your passion for the wild. These courses are the perfect way to gain a deep understanding of the African wild, even if you have limited time. Join one of EcoTraining's six short courses. You will receive a discount when you sign up through the Wild Earth website. Further your journey as a true bush enthusiast today. Great, thank you so much for joining us at Prattland Echo Training Safari Life. We have this young uh, bull that joins us at a waterhole. He's just coming slowly and he just went down. You can hear his footsteps going down and that it's a heavy animal. Of course, uh, these animals, they are so heavy. A fully grown elephant weighs up to five to six tons easily. And as reason, there's so much 
uh, conscious when they move in areas where they can really uh, have damage or they can block themselves because being so heavy like that rolling on the dam wall you might fracture us iconic african mammals live large in humanity's imagination Across the continent, fascinating mammals have evolved to fill every conceivable niche. Their struggles for survival, natural and anthropogenic, mirror those of wildlife the world over. Because they are so beguiling, Africa's mammals have become ambassadors for the Earth's remaining wilderness. So we've managed to catch up with them again and as you can see it is beautiful light. We've got the big male and one of the youngsters. I don't know if that's the straggler that um, has straggled again but uh, he's with the old man so it's all good. The male is um, eating a bit of grass, helping him with uh, clear out his gut. And they do say if you want to catch your food, you need to act like the food. So maybe that's what the lion's doing now. No, I'm just uh, playing around. He's uh, obviously just getting that in. You know, most carnivores will do that. Just feed on grass, helps to clear out the gut. And they do seem to choose particular grass as well. Nice leafy strands and mostly green shoots as well. So we're following in with this pride. I'm hoping that they do spot something while we are with them and we might see a bit of action. So Christy, I'm glad that you're watching and I'm glad that your granddaughter is with you. And I am very proud to show these lions and especially that really regal looking male. He is in fantastic condition and the youngsters growing up very fast. Now they have disappeared and once again we're going to have to wrap around and get in front of them. So, are you guys ready? Are you going to come with us? I think we're going to have to... Oh, hang on. We can still see them before we do. Zigzagging in and out of these thickets. But as I said, luckily for us, it's getting a little bit less dense here in these parts. So we have a much better chance of actually seeing what's going on. Hi, my name is Claire. 
Wildlands has been part of this home for many years as it connects us to the bush and the culture that we love and miss so much. I became an explorer so that other people around the world can get to experience the African bush in this unique way as well. I am beyond excited that I was drawn to win the prize at Ambakala Game Reserve for three nights. It is truly a dream come true. Sign up today and you could be the one experiencing it for yourself. Great, it's beautiful, beautiful right here. Thank you, BK. BK is, is going to share with you one of the zebra. Let's uh, link away from us. Wow, now look at this, everybody. This is the that chief um, they've been walking for quite some time so now I'm going down for a drink so just enjoy the sighting because it is absolutely beautiful now comes the male one female walking past us everybody else quenching their thirst fantastic And sorry if there's any picture right Composition signal isn't that great, but I think it's it, don't you? the car to achieve and voila today past us Pretty much I think the last of it so anyway thank you, but uh, time to go back to Tristan We tried to follow up on the last position of my reefs, but no luck. We just yeah, checked the drainage line, try to get to where we last saw him, but I just can't get there. So I'm gonna 
actually busy trying to leave the block, but it's not that easy to get out. Um, so we'll just check the roads around here, and I think we might have to wait until it's a bit later to find him. I think he's in the drainage. I did walk some of it, and I found his tracks in the drainage. Um, but they're going up and down, so I suspect he's just found himself a shady spot, and the drainage is so tight and narrow. If I come around the corner and he's there, I'm going to be on top of him, which I don't want to be. So I'm just trying to get my way out now, and um, we'll try a little bit later. Um, and see if we can't figure it out. It's a very, very difficult area, this. Um, he's chosen well in terms of being a leopard and hiding away. This is the kind of place you want to be if you're a leopard. Um, let's know the road is not far now, it's right here. It's just got to get through a little bit of a dense thicket to get to the road, that's all. It's typical that he would be right in the middle. It's such a typical leopard thing is to go into the middle of the block, in the middle of the drainage line, in every shape and form. Um, and the other problem on this is that even if I wanted to off-road on the riverbed to look for him, it's not possible. The road, like you can't drive on the bank of this drainage line. It's too dense and too thick. Um, so that's why I'm just tracking out of the block. Maybe we bump into him on the way, you never know. Oh, sorry, little diker. Bumped into a diker rather than a leopard, but you never know, we might bump into him as we go out um, and try and get out of this area. Okay, while we do that, let's send you across to Rexon up at Pridelands. I wonder if there's any Ailes about there today. Great, uh, this young bull is moving softly, but you can tell that he picks signs for where the other elephant went. He wanders a stage, sniffing on the ground, and he's trying to scoop all the sand, putting it in the mouth. It's how actually sometimes it works. Get to double the sand it if there's anything uh, in terms of a female in mass. Let me position myself because this guy, he might be going straight direct from the mud pool. We might start to see this elephant wallowing and the sounds of wallowing, splash of the mud and all that, it might invite, it might invite other elephant. Oh, it's going other direction. Oh, it's going uh, away straight to the area where we love white not to go. Let me position myself. There's still more animal likes to come here. Yeah? I just want to see if we can see them from here. Yeah. All species are very patient deciding coming down to the water if you are a, um, a zebra, impala, it takes a lot of um, energy because he has to make sure that you read the scent of all angles because the direction sometimes goes, the wind goes go in their own direction. If you don't read that, it will take time because it can be so much dangerous unless if you come in the open space where you can see, but it still doesn't mean that there's no lines in the area. So you have to be make sure that you listen, you observe a lot before you get lost. This dam here is loved by all species. Impalas, they surrounded the dam. I saw impala slowly coming from the, the southern side of the water hole, approaching the water from the uh, behind the dam wall, which is really great. The zebras look like they're in numbers. They're not only one zebra. Slowly, some of them are getting close to us. Look at that color in the environment. It's really looking like a dazzle, very little bit fuzzy, where you cannot, from the distance, if he's right in the middle of the uh, bushes, you might not see. Is how actually they confuse lines in most cases, the colors they have. I've seen once before, I, might, I really confused myself that day, that zebra knows that in the course of a day, it's very confusing 
to the lions. We saw the lion lying down and come close and uh, they were really shouting at the lions and keep on going and the lion didn't do anything. That means that uh, they can know that the colors they have is very good in the course of a hot day. But at night, we tend to see lions reading those colors inside woodland, five kilometers, I mean, three, one kilometer away if it's uh, in a thicket. If it's really in the open, they can go for three kilometers. If in the open there's no trees, lions at night, they can see zebra so easily, about three kilometers if the ground is flat and able to make decision and approach. You have to see the lion when they're hunting Maasai at the right time of the year in winter, where you can see the flat ground. Lion spotted uh, zebra from far distances and able to go. In the course of uh, a day, it doesn't happen like that. And also summer, because of the grass is very tall, it really helps quite a lot and save. Lots of species here get hunted very easily. That's the reason summer is one of the most um, season where we don't see much of the lions and leopard because they can be in a thicket. Winter becomes to be a high season right here. In some of the lodge, they'll tell you about high season, it everything change. It's unbelievable because they know that it's quite a lot of uh, game that you're going to experience. Lovely. Unbelievable. He's right on top of the tear mind and able to see he's benefiting the rest of the family by getting there because he can see something coming from far while the others are on the bottom moving on the ground it's very elevated and he can see a leopard lions moving and he can give a signal so easy That is the sign or communication sign of the zebra. If they're happy, more especially if they get seek attention from the youngster or female. You know, they, they do a call like sometimes uh, very loud. The species that do have canine, like uh, all species that uh, possess canine, as far as lions, hyena. Leopards, the canine is to help them to bite. The biting force of the zebra, it can left um, a lion without a tail. Stacy asking question, will back me big, big here there. Uh, FC, you, you break up there. Can you repeat your question for us? We didn't copy. Yes, of course. They they do know that because sometimes they use the, the sides of the species itself to dominate other species. They know that uh, they're huge. They know that they're big. They know that uh, 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 really they know... They know everything that they're small, they cannot compete. Like in Palali, for instance, they know that they're small, they cannot compete with the kudu. Simple like that way. They, they know that. But especially some of these animals, let me take an example with an elephant. Elephant knows everything about itself because it's one of the most intelligent species. They're similar with human being, even more than human being. We just, uh, we have um, the privilege because we can able to control all these species or we tell ourselves to control the animals but it's not the way it's just because we are so much um, eager about everything and uh, it's not the reality elephant is the one of the species that the most intelligent there's reason they can read our mind there's reason they can read us our failure and also everything that we 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 think elephant can know it and also they know that uh, we are weak people so they're strong heavy there's reason if you run, they can chase you. If you go to the house, they destroy it because they know that they are more powerful animal and something that all the time they have in their mind. They, they know everything. They might even our communication. There's reason elephant 
if you shut an elephant with your body language and your voice that comes out, it can really identify by elephant your anger and your also your happiness. Elephant can really tell us that. There's reason walking in a bush, they know that if you are, are, are really nervous and weak, they read that. So they cannot be failing to know that uh, you are uh, very light in, in weight, they're heavier than anything. They, they know that. Even this species, zebra, they know that. I just believe that uh, we, we read quite a lot of books and uh, sometimes we tend to uh, focus on the basic information, not to expand our mind that uh, these species, they have their own communication mind also that they can really know to the best what we as human, what is a human being. For instance, they know that we live in the same era. There's reason when the leopard, they get old, they tend to be so much dangerous to us because you know that you go one way and and come back one way in and one way out and tend to be a really a danger for our life. Well, especially if that leopard have bad experience of human being or elephant, tend to be nowhere to get you. Wow, look at that velvet monkey, the security of the bush. Those sounds just go straight through you. So, our Nkosi Ngonyama, as we call it here, in Isikosa, in the Eastern Cape, or the Lion Pride, has disappeared off into the thickets, but they are disappearing towards where the three Madodahlosi were, or the three Amigos, the three male coalition of Cheetah. So I wonder if they're going to go and pursue them again. They've been doing that quite regularly, have the lions, but generally it's just been the male that's been going out and doing it all on his own. Now, he's, um, as Morgan said earlier, 
He's uh, brought in the reinforcements. He's taken the whole pride along, maybe in the hopes that they can uh, then snuff out the cheetah. But I don't think they stand much chance because those three boys, they really have their wits about them and I don't see the lions catching up with them. However, they do have big fat bellies and they were snoozing soundly yesterday. So I just hope that they don't get caught unawares. But um, as I say, they are lion conscious and I don't think that uh, it's going to result in them being caught. But we'll have to go and see if we can catch up with the three amigos. Uh, they haven't been spotted today yet. So we are going to slowly try and get into that area um, and try and find them, hopefully before the lions do. And then we can see what happens there. So we are now obviously just looking at a landscape and watching the wind blow through the vichilia or the old acacia white thorns, the sweet thorn. It is very windy. I can just hear a greater double colored sunbird off in the thicket here but I think his calling is not having much of an impact because there aren't any other birds calling I think wasting their energy as that little one is doing but we will now go down and head into the thickets here and just see what we can find because this wind is getting pretty hectic so we're going to try and get out of it for a little while and wait for the sun to dip a little bit before we go and head into the area where the three amigos were last seen and that was us we saw them last yesterday afternoon you're looking now in an easterly direction that's towards the bushman's river basin and uh, well everybody all the lodges and all the guides have come on to the western side today um, where it's normally the other way around because the breeding herd of elephants are here the Lions are here, the cheetah are here. So, and Lisa, your comment, absolutely. Amakala is always green and beautiful. Doesn't matter if it's dry or not. Uh, you always see this lovely landscape. So it's quite a special place, all year rainfall. Although, as I say, in the last few years, we've had uh, quite a drought period. We're just coming out of that. And it's been, it's been rather wet this year and all the the dams are starting to fill up, the rainwater tanks and everybody's houses are filled up nicely. So we're hoping we don't head too soon into a dry period, although that is also uh, predicted that we're going to shortly be heading into a dry zone. So let's hope that it's not too bad because we'd love to see the Bushman's River flow once again. It hasn't flown, flown, it hasn't flowed for about eight, around about eight years been totally dry and with it also being so dry a lot of the farmers everybody extracting water out of the underground so that underground water table needs to fill up before I think the Bushman's River is going to flow so it, we need excessive amounts of rain for that river to be, begin flowing from this side so because it is a estuary or influenced by the ocean uh, the, the sea pushes up it's a tidal river um, but the freshwater part of it now is absolutely dry. So all we can do is look forward as we are doing right now and hope that uh, we have wet periods ahead. Anyway, we are going to head on down this road and see what we can find. And I'm going to head you off down the road as well, all the way to Cedric. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ralph. Uh, yes, uh, unfortunately, old, uh, old Wendy, we were just uh, we were back at camp just for a little bit, just to. So Wendy was just in for a little bit of a surgery, uh, one or two things that had to be adjusted, and uh, yeah, now we're out again, out again. But now I've come to this site in Pilot Plains. Why? Because Tristan and myself uh, heard somebody calling in that there was a male leopard or tortoise pan. I'm sure coming in from the west over into Juma and so Tristan is still working around close to the more of the western area I'm just coming here towards Impala Plains um, just to see if anything is moving across this uh, area I just want to see what they're saying here but yeah let's take a look or oh, maybe go a little bit further down 
Um, I might still end up going towards Trials Dam, that area. Uh, I was there a little bit earlier. It was a bit quiet, but I was also making my way to the Hina Den. And the Hina Den, well, as I said, I had to head back to camp due to uh, one or two little issues, but it's all up and running again. So I think what I might do is just slowly head south and go and pop my nose in at the Juma Clan Den site. One diffle. Alright, it's still very warm this afternoon, but very interesting, very strange weather. Got the bit of cloud now all of a sudden. It seems like it's cooled, cooled down the weather a little bit, like um, not much by much, but it feels a little bit cooler. Another 37, 38 degrees Celsius heat. What do you think, Paul? Much cooler. Yeah. Yeah, it is a bit cooler. I agree. Chopsu, oh, thanks for joining us on our Sun Set Safari, Chopsu. Yes, I know it's good to be out again. I was a little bit worried there, but uh, I'm glad we are out again and at least we can still scratch around for maybe a leopard or lion or wild dogs or some hyenas or elephants or oh, whatever comes ahead. So I'm looking forward to being out again this side. I'm like, no, not my last drive. I'd not like my last drive to be sitting without uh, without being out on safari. So, but it is good that we are back in action. Back in action. Oh, Tristan now is saying something about Tortoise Pan's uh, tracks, or that male leopard tracks, uh, heading back into Simonbili, maybe to one up Pan. But he does a lot. He's in and out all the time. He really moves back and forth into this area then back into Arethusa you know that's other uh, properties that's just to the west of us standing by go Pete how's that said outside not much just there was a blow on the bottom and that's it all right, copy Pete. Yeah, it just sounded like uh, my daughter Ingwen Konzoska well they saw uh, Ingwen coming into Juma yet one up pan but it seems like a cross back into Simambili again. No, nothing, nothing uh, this afternoon so far. Uh, sorry, just letting him know what's happening. Uh, just letting the other guy know what's happening and uh, what's happening with the tracks and what's happening on Juma for the afternoon. relaxing at a waterhole with the sights and sounds of Africa all around you. Well, we have some really exciting news for you. From August 1st, AfriCam is joining forces with Wild Earth to bring the majesty of Africa right into your living room with nine incredible new waterhole cameras from across South Africa and Kenya. Get ready to embark on a new journey. This is Live at the Waterhole.
Well, if you want to join us on a, a mission, on Wild Earth's mission to really bring a nature to the world, and you want to know more about it, you can go on to the website, that is wildearth.tv, and you can just click on the donate button, and then you can find out all about the mission itself. Yeah. Oh, it looks like leopard tracks. Oh, it is nice female, female leopard tracks, fresh going down this way. Fresh. Very. Alrighty guys, so we've raced quickly to the gate because we got a report of a leopard crossing into Juma. So we went there, found the tracks coming in and they promptly turned and went straight back out again. And they've gone into Simambili, so it must have been tortoise pan for a male leopard. Um, I think he came to those mud wallows off of Vyotel Access and there was no water for him. So he went back that way because he kind of went straight in, straight out. Um, towards those pans and then turned outwards. And by the time I got there his tracks were very fresh on top of the vehicles. Um, from the day, which on Triple M means it's like now, um, and they had already gone in. Here's what it is, it's the way it goes. Um, sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. A few, what, three days ago he crossed onto our side and Cedric had a great sighting of him. So, it's unfortunately the case. Um, initially when I got there I found the tracks going out first and I thought the guys mistaked and kind of got it wrong saying that he was crossing into Juma rather than out, but then I found where he went in first and then so anyway we're gonna go back to our area with Mareeps see if we can find there was tracks for him coming down Gallagher shortcut I don't know if they're from him coming in last night or if they from this morning after we had him but it's the first sign we had of him so let's go and check um, I didn't check that area this morning we found him on the other side of Gauri Dam this morning uh, so I just want to double 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 check because if those are the right tracks the other day when he did the route opposite to this so he was going from south to north and um, these are coming north south he then was in that western side of quarantine cut across into that block that he came out of now so i'm thinking if it's creature of habits maybe he's doing the same route but just in reverse so he'll come western side of quarantine head straight down um, towards sort of trias area so i was thinking i'll just go and check there see if there's any tracks if there's nothing um then we know that he hasn't crossed this way um, and then we'll go and start checking back towards Gallego again that he's still in there and this was the tracks then from this morning getting to where he was. But I, it's nice now, there's a bit of a sort of cloud cover that's come in so it's not nearly as hot as it was, which is good. Stacy, hmm. Probably, I would probably say the Mulawati sighting, just because of the time spent with him, which is very unusual, um, and it was during the day, so that was really, really nice. I think that's probably the standout for me. S8 roaring was really pretty epic, um, especially his timing. The one after the the last roar that he did as he was leaving the property was just kind of perfect. He just roared his way to the boundary. As he got to the boundary, stopped roaring and crossed out. Um, so that was quite nice and that, ho that whole drive actually was really nice. We had the little baby rhino and we had those nice Ellie's at Buffalzook Dam. So it was just a nice all-round drive. But probably the best sighting, single sighting for me would have been the Mulawati one. Um, Marif's has been epic but you know it's been tough with him. He's been in thick areas and it's not been easy at all. Um, from a viewing point of view it's been a lot of like trying to just keep up with him the whole time. 
Um, Kuchava was nice on the mound as well, she was pretty cool, uh, light was good, but again also busy sighting, walking, moving, um, so yeah, Mulawati I think, I like those slow paced sightings from time to time, and then Marif's this morning was cool as well, for the bird, catching the bird was quite fun, um, I don't know, I like any of those sightings, they're all good. Alright, so I just want to pay attention now, because if he did cross, he would have crossed somewhere over where it's had access in this general vicinity. Um, which is where his dad and sister like to mark on that marula. So he normally goes into this block here and then cuts across through here onto the western side of quarantine. Now obviously Vuerte access gets driven quite a bit so if you move through this morning I know there was two or three cars that moved up and down here already so if I don't see anything here what I might do is just go onto the western side of quarantine just check that road it'll be easier to see tracks there because no one would have <coughs> driven there. You alright Ryan? Yeah? Oh, okay. Good. Rian uh, is coughing in the back there. He's just got to make sure that we don't have to administer any sort of um, first aid to Rian. Not that I think it was necessary, but you never know. Always good to check. Alright. Nothing that I can see here. Nothing that seems to be coming off of Gallagher's shortcut here. Cedric did drive this road and he obviously told me about these tracks. Um, so I just want to double check. It's going to be trickier now because a, a vehicle would have driven on them. Um, but hopefully we'll find the last footprint and then be able to go from there. Oof, it's nice not to have that sun blazing on us at the moment. It's a few clouds to the to the west. Alrighty, let's try and see if we can pick up these tracks. In the meantime though, let's send you across to Cedric to see what he's going to be getting up to now that he also went to that area and did not find said leopard that crossed out. All right, so I'm still following up on a female leopard tracks coming all the way on Zoe's Balanites, jumped onto Zoe's, but then it kind of cut right across. Very strange, you know, I know you sometimes should Shadulu, if it is Shadulu, that female leopard, she would stick a little bit to Zoe's coming down and then veer off somewhere here, but it seems like um, she changed direction right there. So I'm just going to quickly double check here. Uh, she might have come back up again and went straight back west let's see let's see if we're gonna be lucky this side got a feeling got a feeling got a feeling uh renata <laughs> yes I'm, I'm sure i'll watch uh, my parents love uh, wild earth so i'm gonna go visit my folks so I'm sure they're going to have that on uh, the screen, always for the afternoon. I never miss a early morning uh, safari and of course the afternoon safari. So uh, yes, I'm sure I'll be sitting back and uh, enjoying a uh, life and watching uh, uh, Wild Earth. Definitely, especially sitting with the folks as well. Always, I'm very family orientated, so I always like being around the family. Oh, I love it. Makes me happy. Happy. All right. Now I'm not too sure where these tracks have gone. Uh, what do you think, Kumpo? What do you think? Do you think? Uh, yeah, we'll just go with this road, huh? All right. Wise decision. Wise decision. <laughs> All right. I think I might just go, actually double back again on. Um, a monkey orange because the tracks came it's very strange the tracks came straight east along Balanotis onto Zoe's cut on Termot Mound I'm thinking why would she actually go that way again you know what we should do Rebecca that, that triangle there I think that little triangle that should be a good idea
Well, as you can see, it is a live and interactive show. So if you've got any comments or questions that you want to send through to me or through to us, you know, the naturalist or even the cam ops. And if you're watching on the Wild Earth app or the website, make sure you do register so you can send those comments and questions through. Do do do. do. All right. Um, I'm stuck between two places here. I think. I think I might turn. No, let's go that way. It's just as well do that way. All right, let's go around. I'm going to do monkey orange quickly up that side again, and uh, we'll check. Did, I'm trying to think. Did we come here this afternoon? I'm not too sure. Mm, this morning we did. I know that. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, uh, no updates so far, just my fuzzy Ingwen Kwanzaa is coming on to Bada Nighties Junction, Zoe is just trying to follow up here. Yeah? Okay, copy. Uh, we are the two black and the other half of the airstrip, to the airstrip. Some in the other area in there. Alright, so it just sounds like, a, sounds like they got the two black damn male lions on Arethusa airstrip. Interesting, and then of course, uh, seems like a herd of buffaloes that side. So, I want to quickly find out something about maybe Shadulu because I'm thinking it's my this is her tracks here. Uh, you guys didn't pick up on anything on Shadulu that side in the west? No, nothing so far. All right, I think this must be her coming in from you guys in, onto Juma. All right, copy. All right, let's continue the search. Whoa, watch out. And Paul, what is your first uh, meal when you go and leave? What is your first meal? Like, you know, when you go out? Hmm. Mac, 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 Mac D's. A burger, eh? A burger, eh? Nice, nice, nice. All right, yeah. Well, that's not too bad. That's actually very easy to, you know, quick and easy, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, I, I don't know, like, I do prefer to get that, that first little bit of sushi sometimes, it's sushi, but then all of a sudden, I don't know, so. It's, uh, so the, the sushi, I don't know, it's just, but I have to go to the coast to actually enjoy it, you know. Uh, and when I go to the coast, I don't know, because you're at the coast, it seems like it's just fitting. Any, I love it. How do we know who the parents are of the characters, animals? Is that what I heard? Did I hear right there? Okay, so uh, specific leopards or leopards in general. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll know when you see a little cub growing up with mom, like Tandi and Tlalamba. Well, of course, Tlalamba will be the daughter of Tandi. Uh, when it comes to fathers, well, we've got, of course, the Panthera program where the people take uh, a scat and do DNA from the scat, take DNA from the scat so they can actually see then who's their father. So. Yeah, that is makes it more kind of, I can say, um, pinpoint and correct when it comes to identifying who the father is for those specific uh, leopards. But uh, mom's very easy because you just know <laughs> the cub is brought up with mom. So the mom, the little one will be around the mother for some time. Looks like a little vehicle here at the moment, so 
I'm just gonna quickly bypass this person. All right, how they are there? Hey, Reef, how's it? How are you? I'm just live at the moment. So yeah, um, um, yeah. There's leopard tracks that's going that side onto Zoe's area. So I'm just gonna quickly take a look around that side. Okay. Uh, bye, everybody. Oh, it's nice to meet some of the guests from other uh, lodges and uh, just give them a good old wave. Hello. Oh, I just have to be friendly. Of course we're friendly. I ain't poor, we're friendly people. Yeah. Right, so I just told him where we've got leopard tracks heading and uh, just gave him a quickly an update there. So let's see. Let us see. Did you hear? The schools are out. Yep, it's time for the school holidays and Wild Earth is celebrating with special content just for kids. Join us from the 21st to the 25th of August for five days of fun. Our guides will be taking on a number of survival tasks and together we'll learn how to survive in the wilderness, build things and have fun in the wild too. Wild Earth Kids, it's in your nature. So this corner here is normally where so there's a path that comes out. So this is where you would expect to start seeing tracks. This is where I turned this morning. Um, and there was nothing here this morning. So if there is here now, then we know these are really good. But alas, it does not look like anything at all. No, no sign of him coming out. I think he must still be somewhere on the drainage here. It's gonna come out at some point. It's just gotta be patient and just keep looping um, <clears throat> and just wait for that time that he does. 
It's exactly like most cats when they get into a sleeping place, they'll eventually wake up, stretch, and they just start to go for a little walk. I'm sure off with a big belly like him, like he's got, he needs a bit of water this afternoon. So we'll just double check all the places where potentially could get water. So like somewhere like here, you see these little seeps that you've got? Like these would be good places to check for him, even though the water doesn't look great, it's actually seeping out of the the ground and so good place for him to be able to drink all right but nothing here i just it was maybe not a bad idea for two seconds just to turn off um this morning when we were following him it's amazing how the birds can lead you to a leopard if you've got tracks and you can hear birds you winning at life, um, but it's all very, very still and very quiet. It's interesting following Mareeps at the moment. He's not walking on roads much at all. It's mostly, mostly, mostly along drainages. So he's obviously worked out something that works for him. Um, maybe he's worked out that this is the way to find food. Uh, it's by walking the edges of the drainages, also with all the water that we've had through the rain. Um, a lot of the drainage lines still have nice little holes that elephants have dug. So water is available in those little elephant diggings. Maybe that's why he's just cruising the drainage lines more than he's actually trying to walk on road networks. Um, find the drier it gets, the more a leopard likes a road. Um, in terms of kind of moving about, unless it's rained. If it's rained, then they like the roads too, because obviously you don't like walking through all the wet grass. It was where we were this morning, weirdly enough, it was over there. So it's almost like he's done a big loop coming back. And it makes sense to me for water point of view, because if he doesn't drink out of these little elephant wallows here, there's nothing else that I've found on these drainages, and I've walked them quite a bit the last couple of days. Um, and then the other big water source is Gauri Dam. So if he wants water this afternoon and he didn't want to cross north into Buffalzook, he's got to come back this way. And then, so even though he's done his little meow through the block here, he's got to come back this way or take the western side of quarantine and go all the way down to Trias Dam. Philemon Stip actually would be closer, but I don't know if he's drinking there at the moment. The other day he walked straight past that area. I'm just driving very slowly because I also think that if he is around now and he's not moving, he's just going to be passed out under a bush. Kathy Lee, I did see the mouse lion earlier this afternoon, just before we went and started our sunset safari. And mouse lion's doing 100%. Strong like bull. A little tough. Head still attached. Becoming more and more a part of the mound as the days go by. This clay has dried quite a bit now, so it's looking a little bit more termite mound-ish and less mouse lion-ish on top there. But we'll see if Trish and Tess manage to pick up that there's something on top there or if they just like, what is going on? Or if they just overlook it completely. If they overlook it completely, mouse lion has completed a successful transition into mastering the art of camouflage. Okay, Rusty. Quiet. I mean, you can see here, it can be anywhere in this. It's like a needle in a haystack in here. So you've got to be so lucky to find this cat in this area. And it's one animal, you know, at least with a pride of lions, you multiple heads can lift, multiple tails flick. It's one leopard. Not, not simple. So I'll turn off here and just listen for a little bit. You can hear some birds alarm calling here. I might go just have a little quick look there. In the meantime, while I go and just scratch there, let's send you across to Rex and see what's happening up at Pridelands.
Great, thank you from Tristan. We have tried to check around here. We are back at the dam. And really what we spot here, it's a pike kingfisher. It's hunting fish here. You can tell that it's one of the guarantee that uh, at this waterhole is now fish that uh, are living in the dam. And most of the time I've asked, the guys said they have no idea. It's right on a big nest. They haven't uh, got reported. They are quite f active around here every day. I believe that uh, the reason why it says it's all about hunting fish. Without fish, you cannot be active around. In most, you find in a permanent river where they can benefit quite a lot. They become territorial, these guys, part kingfisher. Can you still see it? But the dead tree here on yeah. the. Yeah. In the was, nest. And then that's more to the west of it, it is sitting there. If we go uh, higher. There's somewhere there. You see him? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I think that's him, is it? Yes, of course. I believe so. I can't see well. But it uh, looks like him. Is waiting in most cases because fish most of the time they need to breathe, take an uh, I mean, have an oxygen is where the pike kingfisher they can create quite a lot of shade that are hovering on top of the water and that simulate as paras I mean, a butterfly or insect is struggling, of course, to get out of water. The wings are very wet. And they goes out as they try to shoot from the water, try to catch that kind of uh, insect struggling on the water. Meanwhile, it's a shadow. By that time, they jet into the water and spear out the fish. Such amazing. They, they react very quick. They're so much fast. Oh, look at that. You just dip in. It might be, look like it's got something. Look at the. Uh, there is a uh, pied kingfisher, which uh, uh, it quite um, slightly bigger than the others, and we got others which are very small, malakat kingfisher, a bronze kingfisher, which is slightly smaller. Of course, there's giant. There's a big one called giant kingfisher. He's the biggest. He caught the fish. You have seen that. He was really taking flying with the fish very quick <laughs> to really swallow that. It's unbelievable. We've seen that uh, that means in this water could be tilapias. The fish that lives in the water here, the way they look. Unbelievable. That is my first kill around uh, Dover Dam that I've spotted today. It's such amazing. A little bit far to get details. It was, we were struggling. Beautiful sound that comes out. Pigeon. He is really active here. He's hunting a lot. Uh, he might uh, head out on that tree. He was diving and he off. I can hear pigeon around the camp, which is really calling loud. Yeah, he disappears somewhere there. He might be low down on the ground, which is really amazing. We, we had, uh, we can hear elephant breaking twigs. Maybe he might come back uh, towards the waterhole. But from there, we'll try to head more to the north. Maybe we might uh, have a little bit of coverage. You never know. We'll try new areas to see if signal is gonna hold I mean hold for us around leopard dam it's one of the area that uh, I, I love the most to go around there's nothing much that we can
Get ready for your daily dose of African wildlife magic. Be enchanted by the intimate moments shared by the animals as they drink, play and interact in their natural habitat. With our daily wildlife videos, you'll experience the thrill of safari adventures without ever having to leave your seat. Let the wild adventure unfold right before your eyes. Africam, always live, always wild. Thank you so much. Look what we have uh, found here. A beautiful, peaceful female giraffe. Amazing. Look like uh, it's uh, really hearing something around me. It's not moving. I don't think it's a hit. Maybe you might uh, try to get the rest of the tower of giraffe that are in the area. Sometimes these guys, if the hear something they can stop and listen carefully around in the area if there's anything close by or anything in danger I've seen giraffe in most cases even spotting a snake they can dead st stand still and watch oh, look at that it's eating all these new leaves green sort of that really gives um, highly nutrition This is all what the elephant have uh, really break and the new shoot comes out. All right, no success with uh, those uh, leopard tracks coming south on Zoe's. Uh, she is around there somewhere, but uh, you know, I have to just spend a little bit of time trying to track uh, track that female down. So I have left that area, and I am just going to head slowly towards Twin Dams, Treehouse Dam, take a look around the other southern side. And as I said, I was going to make my way towards the hyena den but we will do that very shortly so yes let's just take a look so i'm on the fire break road at the moment this is where, I've, where we had at the lumber yes um so she was not too far behind us in south and then looks like she came north again so that leopard came straight back in to juma
I don't know if it wants to rain or what. Right on. Uh, Moxie, a, a bearded vulture aura. Oh, Harpy Eagle. Um, no, Moxie, I actually haven't. I haven't seen either one. I haven't seen either one. So, oh, sorry. I haven't seen them now. Yeah. I would love to see them. Oh, but there's so many other birds I would love to see as well. I mean, I think in the States, beautiful bald eagle. I think that is a stunning, stunning bird. Almost looks like a fish eagle, but just as a very bulky, big beak. I would love what one eagle I would love to see that we do get here, but very, very uncommon. More around the big river areas, um, the drainage lines. So something like the uh, the Sabi River or the Sand River, you'll get those uh, crowned eagles. Oh, the crowned eagle is but beautiful. It's just the the coloration, but as well, it's very speckled. It's very dotty. It's got a very like kind of a speckled uh, look to it, and oh, stunning, especially when they've got the big crown. And if you look at their talons, is huge. And why so is because they fly between the forest, uh, the forest areas, and between the trees and it. And if they go for like monkeys and little uh, dakers in the forest, the red dakers, blue dakers. So yes, that is something that is quite phenomenal to see is uh, a crowned eagle. Apparently, there in uh, the Natal area. People actually have issues with them around there with their dogs, their pets. Because uh, if a crown eagle sees a little poodle or a chihuahua or something like that running around on the lawn and that eagle's around, yeah, no, I'm sure that eagle is going to take that opportunity and swoop down and grab that dog. So. And they're a little bit more common in the Natal area, further into another province called Natal, KwaZulu Natal. And uh, remember, was it uh, a place called Manioni, Manioni Reserve? And uh, there was uh, a, a camp there where they had the crowned eagles busy nesting right there at this tented camp. Beautiful, beautiful crowned eagles that side. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, but for us to get them here, mm, yeah, the northern area is very tough because we don't have those big drainage lines. All right, oh, I see. All right, let's just pop in at Twin Dams. Linda Polly saying, keeping everything cross for a leopard or a hyena. Yes, Linda Polly. Oh, what about your owl, Linda Polly? Your owl, that would be very nice. But Linapoli, let's see. Hyena first, so we're going to go to Hyena Den very shortly. After Hyena Den, then I'm going to try and find that female leopard. Yes, we shall find that female tonight. Indeed, indeed. Or ask Tristan to see if Tristan maybe he might be in the area. So give us a hand that side. <laughs> Let's go to Twin Dams. You're really there from Paul. Brian, you say hyenas. Yes, I'm sure a lot of you will be very excited just to get uh, one of the vehicles in there very soon. So. As I said, it is the plan, the plan. And no news on Nguazi. I don't know what happened to Nguazi. No news. I've, I spoke again to one of the guides in Chitwa, because I mean they see them more often than we, than we do. And um, no, no news on that uh, hyena that got bitten by those black damn male lions. All right, while we approach uh, Twin Dams, let's head over to Rex and see what's happening in Pridelands. Great. 
Capital is uh, we're gonna head west of the conservancy checking around here maybe we might be lucky and yes we wanted to head down towards the Highland Den and check around there but um, the last information on the radio the den now the hyena puppies are active which we don't have signal on that area so we're, we're gonna head uh, towards the the west we'll keep on listening on the radio time and again the guys will update us and let us know if uh, is any change but uh, I know that the single hyena she's always uh, loved to be on the other den but the last update there they will like all on the uh, puppies den let's see this area here quite a lot we have followed tracks of uh, the uh, leopards and lions look like a, a male leopard there's one male leopard likes to come here and cross towards the railway line off to the south, eight span direction. But today we have seen the tracks early in the morning. We work around uh, a leopard dam. There was nothing. Let's see if we might find something here. There's no report yet of anything around in the area. It's only the young male lion that were coming from the east. Pretty much he might be lying down. It's too hot at the moment. Furthermore to the east where we have no coverage. But it might happen that uh, tonight might be in the vicinity of the camp towards the west. Okay, so as you drive quite a lot of uh, elephant down, this is one of the area. There is a breeding herd of elephant that likes to hang around in the area. One of the females, she's having a shoe task. The two of them actually look like both of them, the oldest female within the pride, such as pride itself. I mean, with the herd itself, not a pride. It seems like uh, they are in church. Let's see if we might come across with them or not. But uh, cross fingers, we need to see a leopard here. Or lions. it could be a huge and this area here it look like it's the best remember snakes like uh, a very rocky area I'm just listening to a, a lamb call of Mark power truck here maybe it's a snake who knows there is spawn quite a lot let me check because I can hear also horn balls. Sometimes it could be something small, like uh, a wildcat. They're all like seeing something right here. I'm gonna stop here. This is the hornbow. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. Unbelievable. A bite of cuckoo. It could be a snake that's moving here. Or oh, something small like a wildcat. Of course, if you find all the species really get together and show a little bit of a concern. We had this magpie shark and this is a 
yellow, I mean red billed hornbill. This is more like a display, uh, to, to a display uh, call. But the magpie shrike, when we get here, you can still tell the extended coming from there. It tells that they have seen something and they are going in the low branches of the trees. We see something moving very low, heading in a direction, maybe where we're going. Let's go around towards the the railway line maybe it can help us if it's a snake it just uh, it won't going to see it because you know that uh, it's all this bad when they get to see a snake they get together different species of bird congregate together and try to fight back that is a sign to tell the snake we can see you you cannot hunt us get away uh, also sign if it's a genet we can see you you cannot hide within our area. Snakes sometimes are territorial, some of them, like black mamba. Black mamba can cover up to 20 kilometers square of an area and become a territorial on that particular area. So you'll move from one corner to another. You won't find snake in the same area. Same as these animals that are territorial. They move within the area where they know that is their spot. See, I won't forget this is one of the area when I was beginning here I've saw many lion kills and also lions crossing here. Uh, this is the high perfect spot. If it's a leopard you can see. We love all the support, we read all the comments, and now we want to acknowledge our biggest fans. Do you know when Ribbon was seen last? Or the names of June's cubs? Do you remember the last time we were up close and personal with an elephant? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then you are in for a treat. Wild Earth's Fan of the Month, we are looking for you. For more details, make sure to read our monthly mailer and keep an eye out on our social media pages. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. My survival task for today is a task to stay safe and stay warm. Now how do we do that here in the bush if we don't have any sleeping bags, we've only got the clothes that's on our body and now uh, it's a very cold evening that's coming ahead. How do we stay warm? 
and how do we stay safe? All right, so this is one of my favorite ones because I think at the end of the day, if you're going to try and stay warm, first of all, on a very, very cold evening, you come to one of these termite mounds, exactly this mound that I've got here now. So these termite mounds is still very hot inside, or not hot, but warm itself. Get 26, 27 degrees inside there and uh, always come around you. But the first things first, you've got to have safety. Safety is number one. So always grab yourself. I always get a stick like this. So usually a stick with a, a V on it or like a fork. And in case, but a bigger one than this, because I mean, if this, if there's a warthog or even a squirrel, a squirrel that comes for me, I think that will snap this branch. But yeah, get something. So in case there is something inside this mound, because you've got to first check. It could be honey badger, it could be a warthog, it could be maybe uh, snakes. You never know. So you always have to approach this mound. Always to the side. First thing, to the side. Always take a look now inside just to see if anything is inside there making sure making sure call out make a bit of a noise here listen out also very important listen because you can start seeing a little bit of dust maybe something is moving there and kicking out of uh, kicking up some dust where does the dust go it's going to come out here and then you're going to see uh, uh but there's something inside here but for now i don't see anything there i see leopard tracks on top here i've got a leopard track here but uh, not too fresh but other than that, nothing there. That is now, of course, your home for the night. Nice and warm, nice and cozy inside there. It's going to be safe because now it's only one entrance, one exit. So if any dangerous game is going to come around here, it's going to come in there. Yeah, it's going to come here, but you don't want to get cornered. So what do you do next? Next thing, you go and take a look. Now, I'm, I don't have big uh, thorn trees, but I'm just going to quickly take a branch here just hold on there one or two just uh, i'm going to be in a quarry bush at the moment and uh, i'm going to try and see if i can grab one or two branches from the quarry bush now on top of this think think of this as being a thorn tree so something like a buffalo thorn a knob thorn black monkey thorn any thorn tree try and get some big branches around and then start covering I'm going to just do it from this side so we can see. So start covering your entrance to the den or to your little place with big branches. So you can imagine covering this with a whole lot of thorn trees. Once you can cover that with the thorn trees, now you're very safe. You got this protection and you can go and lie inside of that mound. But as I say, you got to watch out. These mounds can be so, so dangerous. Um, that's why I'm not even going facing forward, just in case there's something like a warthog that's still inside here. So that's why I'm still just going to stand to the side. But yes, survival, if you need to lie somewhere, I say a termite mound is the best place for warmth and for safety. And Paul, you want to get in? I still need to go and see my daughter. Yes, Nadine, I'm not going to get inside this termite mound right now because I can see there's some bees buzzing around here and I'm allergic to bees. So it's the last thing I want is to get stung by a bee and uh, I don't have any EpiPen with me. So yeah, so I'm not going <laughs> to... But yes, you can still get in here. If it's, you know what, survival is a different thing. If you really want to survive, you are going to try your utmost to do that. I'm not surviving now. You know, that's the thing. I'm not here to really want to get in there and really put my, my life at risk. No, you know, that's not what I feel like. So, good idea. Alka, I, I did check for warthogs. A big sign for warthogs, Alka, is tracks. I don't see any fresh warthog tracks here going in. So that's the first thing I did check. Trust me, I did, because it's the last thing I want to do is go here, and that thing is going to come running out, and that warthog is going to sever my leg right off. So I did check for warthogs. Uh, there's nothing in here, because there's no dust that's bellowing out there. There's nothing that's moving inside there. Nothing. So just I can hear the bees. Then there might be like a little hive or something that's inside here, nice and warm for the bees. So I've got a feeling that that's why I don't want to be there. Kathy, yes, hyenas are big and uh, 
uh, protecting the dens if there's cubs. For sure, but there's no hyena cubs, there's no hyena tracks here. Leopard tracks, I've got some leopard tracks, but that's about it. Uh, maybe a leopard came here, tested out, just sniff, 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 see if anything's here, and that leopard went off. Remember, this den was uh, kind of dug open by the Black Dam male lions. This was used to be the, the Juma clan den site at Twin Dams, but of course you can see that the, they left this den site quite, uh, quite some time ago. And the black dam males, I think it was about two months ago, came here, they dug open and they actually uh, pulled out a warthog from inside this. So, uh, look, you don't want to be lying in there if these black dam males come here, then it's a different story. Uh, then, <laughs> then, I don't know. Anyway, so yes, that is survival tip for the afternoon, for shelter for the evening. I won't go into a tree, I think that will be the best if I really need it to survive. All right, and Paul, you ready? Yep. Cindy D, how deep is the hole? Cindy D, it's very deep, very deep. When I looked in, I can't even see the back. I couldn't even see the back of that, uh, the hole. It's very, sorry about this. Yeah. I couldn't even see the back of that hole. It went right deep inside. So I think two people can sleep there. Two. I think Paul and myself. Are you Wild Earth's biggest fan? Well, we have a brand new competition for you. Join our naturalists on Safari Live and listen out for weekly questions. To enter the competition, head over to our Instagram, search hashtag Wild Earth Fan of the Month and comment your answer under the post. The monthly winner will be determined by the total quickest and most correct answers. We announce our winner at the end of every month. Tune in to Safari Live daily. Great, uh, we have no tracks here. Looks like uh, I might be taking a shortcut on a drainage line and heading kind of uh, east. Let me check finally here. Yeah. Uh, it's not here. We might head at uh, we'll try. We try to stay on this road here. Maybe this leopard from the drainage line is going down and also listening quite a lot of uh, bad species that can help us to locate the leopard.
We are really, we are extra careful here. We are also checking on top of these uh, tambotis because sometimes they would love to go up in the trees. Right, well, while Rex is tracking and looking for a leopard, we are also on our mission to try and get to the northeastern corner. Um, we're quite far away, so we're just trying to get up there. It um, sounds like Clalumba is about to cross onto Juma from Torchwood, which is what we kind of thought she would do yesterday, is go from where she was, Torchwood, and then this way. She still hasn't crossed yet. Um, but the guys are saying she's quite close to the fire break, which worries me a little bit because she can turn into buffles from there sometimes. But I'm hoping she's going to come on the fire break, and then from the fire break she's going to um, she's going to come down that little sort of I don't even know what the name of the I know by now. Um, right, so Rian's just going to wipe the lens quickly because there's a little smudge. Which happens sometimes. Was there a bug? Oh no, that's not good. No one likes a bug on the lens walking around. Um, but we're gonna just try to get up there and hope that she comes down that little track that takes to Buffelzook Dam. Um, so that's the Sudan at this stage. Whether she does it or not is obviously anyone's guess with Clalumba. I was just down sort of around Rebecca's <coughs> Philemon's cut line. Just scratching. I know that it's Shadulu's around. She sometimes pops out there. Um, but I think Cedric's going to go back in that area just now. So hopefully he'll get lucky. And obviously I really, 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 really want to see Klalamba. Um, I've seen Shadulu this year a few times. So Klalamba would be really nice to finish things off. Um, as much as I love all the other cats, she's got a very special part. Even though she drives me up the wall. Um, there's a special part of me that enjoys her. Um, you know, I, I don't know why, I, just, I guess being the first person ever to see her alive, um, there's a pretty special connection there, um, or a special feeling in, in terms of who she is and kind of the, the representing of a good few months um, when I was first kind of settling into Wild Earth. So, yeah. It's, hope to see her. I'm trying to kind of take the most direct route, so I would imagine it's Amal, Gari cut line along the Fuzuk boundary and that should get us there in time um, for her to cross. It's unfortunately not going to be daylight by the time we see her, but that's okay. Um, I'm just hoping if she decides to walk on the road. That area can be quite treacherous if it's at night time and she doesn't want to walk on the road. Very, very, very difficult setting sun is actually quite beautiful this evening but I'm afraid I don't have time to stop for that right now. Crazy how we haven't had a female leopard on this property, well we haven't had many tracks for female leopard and then the last afternoon Clalamba and Shadulu theoretically um, could be on the property. I mean we say Shadulu it could be another female you never know it could be in Sumi it could be So 50 <laughs> Clalamba is the busiest of busy. She is never stops. You know, I was saying, Cedric and I were talking about it. I can count on your hand how many times you've had her static when she hasn't had a kill. If she's got a kill, she's fine, but if she doesn't have a kill, her sitting for a long period, never. She's always, always walking. Um, busy, 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 busy. The only time you ever catch her when she's resting is if it's an extremely hot day. And generally it's not for long. She kind of sees you coming and she's like, oh, you're here now. Okay, excellent. Let's go walk. Um, it's almost like she, she loves the fact that she just drags you through everything that you don't want to drive through. Um, and then eventually she'll like settle down and she's like, okay, now I'll pose for you. You've earned it. So she's well worth it. And let's be honest, she is one of the most beautiful female leopards we have out here. Um, Certainly, like I was thinking about it the other day, I was, you know, I've been fortunate to see my fair share of leopards 
in Africa and I've seen a lot of beautiful cats, but she certainly ranks as one of the most beautiful. Her eye color, and just like her proportions, she definitely got the best of her dad and her mom um, in when she was put together. Alrighty, so it sounds like Mr. Dold has made his way to little Gary and the hyena den. So let's send you across to him and see if the little ones are out. Oh, nice Tristan. So you got a little lumber that side. Wonderful. Great, great find. And as you can see, we are now here at the Juma Den. And we've got just a one little cub. There is an adult that's approaching. But we've just got the June cub here at the moment. Oh, look at him. Isn't it so sweet? Getting that little golden color out. And here comes the female. Looks like Intima that might be approaching here. So Intima is another female hyena, part of the Juma clan. And uh, that is very loud. And she's also got a cub. So let's see, maybe, maybe she'll introduce her little cub to us. It'll be wonderful. Come on. This is Intima. I'm trying to see quickly get my bifocals out here. Looks like. Mm, it looks like it's in Tima. But yes, uh, well, this uh, youngster, of course, still resting out. I think June was here not too long ago. June, uh, the mother of this youngster, oh, the other one just ran now inside because I think it got a fright because this hyena's decided to make its way all the way around to the entrance of the den. Mm -mm. Shreyas, you're most welcome. I'm so glad finally we can get uh, to see Tima that's standing at the entrance of the den and of course a little a June cub uh, just went inside of the den. I think it got a fright when it heard Tima coming around the corner not knowing what it could be. The June was, yeah, but she's disappeared now. I'm going to talk about June. Now June is the mother of that little cub that you just saw. Oh, is she going to bring a little one out for us? Please do so. Maybe. I haven't seen in Timna's cub yet. I think we've only seen it once. Her cub is about, I think her cub is about, if I'm not mistaken, a month old. That's about a month old. Let's see. Oh shit, must be right at the bottom then now. Oh, there comes June's cub. <laughs> and this one is now about five months old. I think it was April, May, June, July, August. Like, oh, very excited. Look at that little tail that's standing upright. Very excited that uh, I'm team team as yeah. And you saw me doing my survival task a little bit earlier. So that was this, this clan that uses that den site as well. But they haven't been using it for quite some time. Well, Oh, you know what, she's going to lie like that. It's going to be very difficult to see that little cub because she's at a, a very difficult angle. So what she's done, she's just kind of reversed in to the entrance of the den. And it's just enough, uh, so it's easy for the little cub to come out and suckle from mom. <laughs> It'll be nice just to see the little one, but you know, we, just, we shall just enjoy what we have for now. Was in Timos I had two other cubs last year. Now Della, June's cub has got really fluffy. I, I think it's looking beautiful. I think it's coming here again. It's like a little bear. Look at it. <laughs> it's so cute. A little bear. And you can see even the nice little gold color coming through now, losing that total black color because when they're born they're 
totally black. And usually about three, four months, they start bringing, getting those little spots that starts appearing on their neck, the front part of their body. Their face starts turning to a little bit of a whiter color. <laughs> right, now it's going to be typically behind a bush. Why there? And unfortunately, she, June, she had two cubs in the beginning. Um, but the one disappeared very early on. I think the first cub disappeared in the, I think it was maybe three, four weeks after seeing that one had disappeared. Mary Macbeth, yes, the one's becoming all spotty now. Typical spotted hyenas, hence the name. And fantastic predators, absolutely fantastic predators. Really robust, strong, gritty, and uh, definitely survivalist. <laughs> Look at this one here. So he's enjoying that bush. He keeps on moving over a little bit of a blade, blade of grass, maybe a bit of. A, was like anal pasting as well. The little cub seeing that all the rest of the clan members do it. I was like, well, why don't I? Why don't I do it? Franny, it is uh, having the June cub. It is lovely. I love seeing this little one. But let's see if it's going to come back again. It's just wandering around now, becoming quite inquisitive. You can't see it now. Unfortunately, there is a tree that is blocking us from viewing the little one. I can hear hyenas calling in the distance. And Timo, where are you looking? Don't, you know, don't come to this vehicle now. Don't be like... And Tima's previous cubs were like this, very naughty. They were very, they were very naughty. We used to call them the Juma mechanics. If you remembered, old Kira and Loki. So Kira and Loki was uh, the cubs of this female that's in the den at the moment. But they both died. Um, and uh, they used to, I used to love them too. But they, as I said, they were the Juma mechanics. They used to always come to the vehicle, go under the vehicle. Next moment I could hear, hear wires going watla watla underneath and then realizing that they've been pulling all these wires out from the vehicle. Not fixing it, but damaging it more. <laughs> Sniffing around, picking up on the scent of something. Maybe Mommy June will be on her way back again. I don't know where she disappeared to. But it can be very vulnerable for little cubs like this wandering around. Look, yes, and Tima is there, but not watching over this one. And this little cub could be just going behind the termite mount, and all of a sudden there could be a lion, there could be a, a leopard, or some other predator. And uh, you know, for that youngster to try and get back to this entrance, and we'll have to really move it. <laughs> you see Tima's here just looking out. So that entrance that entrance to the den is just large enough for the cubs. All right, well, we will sit here for a little bit longer. Let's head over to Tristan to see if he's had any luck on the Queen of Juma. Well, we have got luck. We've got Clalamba. She's in far into Torchwood at the moment. And there's a whole bunch of zebras around that she's kind of stopped and staring at. But we can still see her, so it's all good. Um, hopefully she'll come off of the mound at some point and actually come and see us properly 
Uh, it's going to get dark soon, and then once it's dark, obviously it's going to be very tricky when it comes to being able to shoot her from this distance. Um, she's going to be out of IR range if she stays where she is now. Um, but with the zebras moving around, I'm pretty sure that's why she's stopped. You um, might see the top of a zebra's head bombing through now. Now, um, there we go. <laughs> so they're just kind of moving past. Once I think they passed, then hopefully she'll come down and start heading in our direction. She <coughs> Excuse me. She really likes this area because of the fact that um, there's a lot of dikers that come onto this at night. And we know that Lalamba loves a diker. So you'll see a whole bunch more zebra heads coming through shortly. Um, just going to get the bobbing of the top of their manes as they go through. And you can see how she's just watching them. So the last of the zebras should be any minute now, or any second, should I say now. There we go. That's the last one going through. So hopefully some of you are quick on your screenshot buttons. Um, those of you that like to take screenshots and got the two of them together. But now that they've passed, hopefully that will be her coming down. She'll have to start yawning first before she'll get up and, and go. Um, but I suspect that once they've moved off, then she'll start to, to carry on. Um, you can see it's her from this distance already. It's it's really kind of <laughs> so uh, easy to tell Kalamba. She's got this very unique face and distinct look about her. Um, so it's very, very, very much... Uh, an easy leopard to identify even from here. It's got that kind of rounded little face and that short muzzle. Um, it's pretty though. Carol Kay is a yay, so happy for you guys and myself. Um, yeah, exactly. It's really cool. Um, obviously, was didn't want to kind of not see her this year. It's always a terrible thought. Um, given we followed her since 2017. Um, it's crazy. I, I was thinking about it today, actually, when we were driving. I can't believe that she's actually going to be six this year. Um, it doesn't feel like six years since she was born and was a tiny little nugget. Um, but she's she's been a pretty incredible little leopardess. The only thing maybe that's kind of marring her legacy at the moment is this, this, this lack of cubs um, and her not raising a, a cub yet at six years old. But it's okay. She's still got time and hopefully you know she's going to produce a set of cubs pretty soon and and then from there that will be that and she'll start to get onto a good roll and start to to have a decent amount of cubs um and this last litter was quite sad you know she'd gotten so far with them and she was being such a good mom and just you know just goes to show how hard it is out here actually to raise cubs it was one little slip of slip up and that was the end of that unfortunately
So everybody, you can see in general, just putting their bums towards the wind. And so it does then lessen the exposure to the cold temperature. And you'll often find them doing that. And then in the morning, they stand broadside on to the sun. So then they increase the exposure that their body has to the warmth that comes from the rising sun. And so they warm up much quicker. Springbok do this as well and it's imperative for them to do it because they've got extremely thin skin as opposed to the oryx. Uh, but both species found in very similar habitats. The jackals are just starting to call now. The first call that I've heard as the sun is now starting to set. can't see the body of those giraffe in the background, just their necks and heads. But it's always good to see that they do have babies, and so they are breeding successfully, even though it's not ideal for them here. They left, left. Well, there we go. We asked her nicely to come closer, and here she comes. She was obviously just waiting for the zebras to move off properly before she came through. Hello, beautiful girl. Are you going to come say hello to us nicely? Oh, it's good to see her. She's going to go behind us, I think. Let's see. It's amazing and immediately noticeable just how dark in color she is compared to Marie's. I think she's going to turn. Isn't this cool? And she's kind of walking straight to where we are. She could have gone anywhere she wanted to, but... Stacy, apparently she knew it was our last day and wanted to say goodbye, and she's come as close as she probably could. I mean, you can see how far we kind of tracked her from. Um, and she decided to walk in this general vicinity. But where she's going is not going to be easy, I'm afraid, guys. So I'm going to try to keep up with her as much as I can, but it's not going to be a great um, <laughs> time of it unless she cuts towards the fire break, which I'm really, really hoping that she's going to do. All right, let's just turn <clears throat> before she disappears on us. We know how this cat is. Um, she can be difficult sometimes when she wants to be. Um, but she's going to be hunting. I can see she's already spotted something. I'm just going to stop here because she's going into stalk mode already. Look at the tail. And you can see that she's gotten much more upright. So she's pushed her chest kind of up. Um, and when that tail is doing that like that, you know they've spotted something. And you can see our ears are straight forward, much more alert. <coughs> it's very much like Marieps this morning before he pounced on that bird. It's the exact same way that he is now i mean that she is now so let's see unfortunately there's a couple birds that are shouting at her so i don't think she's got too much chance of getting close to whatever it is but this is the problem and at this time of the day is this is what starts happening with lalamba is you start getting into these situations where she starts to hunt and you end up just having to follow through these thickets but also try and kind of actually keep up with her because she goes trotting she's not like this huntress that goes slowly she likes to trot after things Uh, line 8, I think it's line 8. Um, have I ever seen leopards and honey badgers? Yes, I have. Um, there's also a really cool video that's been around on social media quite a lot from um, down south in the Sabi Sands in Kirkmans where three leopards take on a honey badger and the honey badger fights them off. Um, but that happens from time to time. I've seen it um, a few times actually. Generally the honey badgers win. Uh, leopards normally don't like how ferocious they are. And it's often young young cats that are that way. Sorry guys, we'll turn the radio down. So we've got Gabe to thank for this. So some of you will remember Gabe was here a few days ago. Um, and he let us know about Lalamba, so we have to say thank you to him. Um, but there we go. So Nadine was saying that Marips was with the honey badger about two weeks ago, and he just walked away. 
the younger cats tend to try and go after them the older cats tend to be very wary I can't see what she's stalking. I don't see any impala, I don't see a diker, but I'm wary of how far she's getting from us. Um, I can still see her for now, so I'll keep my distance. But if her body language starts to change and she becomes more like she's stalking, then I'll just turn off again. But for now, she's just looking as though she's kind of just trying to close distance. Um, she doesn't look as though she's that kind of. See, now she's starting to get more stalking. Obviously spotted something far away. Their eyesight is unbelievable. It's uncanny what they can see. Stop for a little paw, clean, and off she goes. You see now she's walking normally again. All right, <clears throat> let's try and just keep up with her a little bit because she's really <laughs> going to test us. I wish she had just walked. If she had walked 30 meters up the road here, we would have been on the road. We wouldn't have had to go through this, but <clears throat> we know that's not how we do things on Juma. Apparently our leopards just don't like roads anymore. They've decided that this is what they like to do. She's got a little mound. What is she stalking though? I don't want to go too far because I'm hoping she's going to sit on the mound. Okay, she's sitting. Let's try creep forward, Rian, because she's sitting now. So while she's seated, it's a good time just to try and creep with her. She ends up drifting. I don't think she actually knows what she's looking at. She's kind of, her head's twitching and moving all over the place. She's not focused in one direction. She's looking right, almost just scanning. Isn't this cool though? She is a pretty cat. Like I say, her coat color is one of my favorite coat colors. She's got her mom's coat. That rich, deep, sort of orangey gold that that part of the family has got. But her Marip's got more the Mulawati light colored coat. Um, both of them have very, very sort of straw color rather than this more orange coloration. Skadi, you're saying she looks hungry and empty belly. I mean, belly's not too empty. I mean, she could do with a meal, but it's not crazy empty. Um, but she definitely doesn't look like she's pregnant. Um, so I don't think she's got cubs in there. And if she does, they are tiny. Um, they're not showing yet. All right, let's just get around in this little bush here. Um, but she does look like she could do with a meal, but she doesn't look emaciated I mean I've seen cats look a lot hungrier than that uh, including her although she typically like the whole family also has a pretty good success rate when it comes to hunting and often often look fat and full um, all the time okay. let's get spotlight out because it's starting to get quite dark and I really can't see her anymore um, luckily, there is another car that's with us. Um, so. She's a tree already. Um, now I can see her, so all good. Sometimes the spotlight is nice. I don't use it much when we're following cats, if I can help it, but just to kind of just see direction that they travel and then you just follow from there. Um, she's not far in front of me. She's heading towards Bufuk Dam. On that, she's gonna hit that little shortcut road, and then I hope that she follows the road and not the drainage. Because if she follows the drainage, that's the end of the sighting. There's a really nice termite mound coming up, so I'm sure she'll go up that termite mound. I'm gonna try to see if I can get ahead of her for that, um, and hopefully, she'll settle on the mound itself for a little bit. On Woodbury Lodge's episode of Destination Safari. I'm so used to views, I forget to mention it sometimes. <laughs> Underfloor heating in the bathrooms, air conditioning, all those luxury items. Dinner is a full three course meal, um, starter, main and dessert. Early morning drive and on that drive you might see some slightly different things, some rare things. You know. Destination Safari, bringing luxury safari travel to the world.
those youngsters also trying to dominate each other. Chem Spok, I mean. And here come the giraffe once more. Looks like the adults are getting involved now. Chasing the oryx around. Can you believe it? Look at this. It's like we're coming a racetrack. There I was saying the oryx and um, the, all the animals give the oryx a wide berth and the giraffe just uh, told me not, that's not the case. We'll chase them off. Morgan trying to get the one up and saying that he did see a warthog now. I still don't see one. Prove it. <laughs> but look at these oryx. As they move around, you'll, you will see they sort of point the horns at each other. Uh, these giraffe are having a ball. She was on the termite mound, settled beautifully, and was about to start grooming herself, and then a rhino walked past, and she then came running down and went and investigated the rhino, um, and is now going into a horrible, horrible spot, which I don't think we're going to be able to keep up with her in, I'm afraid. I'm hoping she's going to settle. She did this such a cool thing. Just as she was getting to the mound, she jumped onto this little tree, and she like walked along the tree like it was a little catwalk. And didn't think she was going to walk on the tree itself, but she decided that's where she wanted to be. And, and, sorry, I'm just trying to see where I'm driving here because there's some eroded gullies in this section that you can get yourself into a lot of trouble quite quickly. So stop here while she's stationary for two seconds. And you can see she's on hunt mode at the moment. She's trying to find anything that's moving. The fact that she even was alert to a rhino moving was testament to the fact that she kind of picks up any sound and she's going to go and investigate it. And off we go. Here she's walking on a nice little open path for us now. A little scent mark while cleaning paws. Multitasking at its finest. And then disappear around the bush. The problem when she's like this is that she doesn't hold direction, so it becomes really tricky to keep up with her if she sees something. She'll just run in any direction. At least like with Mareeps this morning, <clears throat> he's kind of just set direction, so if you lose him, you just go around and... Um, and I'm going to just go back for you quickly. I know it's not ideal because you're going to shoot over my head, but with the infrared I'll just move my head out the way. She's just stopped and stationary. If I go forward, it might push her a little bit, so I don't want to do that. So I'll just stop behind her a little bit and let her groom and do what she wants to do. Cool to see those paws, though. You know, it's not often we get to see the underside. Those are the little paws that make all the tracks. Are you going to lie down there, girl? You are? Okay. All right, let's reposition then, Ryan. If she's gonna lie down then we can. Okay. I think she wanted to settle just now on the mound, but obviously with the, the noise and the movement, she decided to rather not. Rian, is that alright for you? I think that's not bad. Settle into a good grooming session now. There we go. See how she's listening to everything. You can see her ears constantly twitching. She's still looking back where the rhino walked. Um, watching those. There's also a car that kind of is with us at the moment. Um, and they're viewing the rhino. So they're talking that side. Which is probably why she's just checking that way. 
in case there's anything else that she needs to be aware of. Um, cats and hyenas and even impalas are pretty in tune with the fact that cars can often mean something else. Um, so they watch when other cars come in just in case there isn't something that's following behind them. Joanne, I'm sure, whether it be a little scrub hare, an unsuspecting bird, a diker, impala, something I'm sure will satisfy her hunger tonight. We know at Clonumba she's busy, she'll go the whole night until she finds what she's looking for. I'd love to know also how many times she actually does kill Eric and she kills a lot more than we realize. Um, I think she makes kills and we just kind of miss them every now and then. Uh, she's been known to drag kills an excessively long way um, in the past. Most cats when they kill something like a diker will drag to kind of the nearest decent tree that's got a bit of a thicket around it because it's quite a small carcass they can do it. But she, I remember the one time she dragged a steenbok, it was over a kilometer. She took it into, she crossed three roads with that steenbok. Um, for what reason, I don't know. She went past a whole bunch of beautiful trees. She went through a drainage line, which would have made sense to me. But that's just how she is sometimes. She has this thing about dragging her kills as far as she can away from where she killed them. And maybe it's a way that she's learned that if she does that, hyenas struggle to find her a little bit. Um, but hyenas' nose are so sophisticated, I would think that they would be able to pick up as soon as there's any sort of... Um, drag anywhere. Beautiful though. You can see how dilated her pupils are right now. Given how dark it is, she's obviously allowing as much light as she can in. And now? It's the rhino, silly. And she is a beautiful cat, but she's now a gone cat. And I don't even know if I'm going to be able to find her again here. I can think I can see her there somewhere. Just trying to see if I can see with a light before. So I know where I'm actually going. <sighs> All right, let's try. See if I can find her again. And to be honest with you, if she really is running in this stuff and she's hunting, I really don't like following cats when they hunt at night. Um, I can't see what they're hunting and therefore I um, sorry Ryan, I can't see where I'm reversing Let's put that light on um, and therefore I just end up disturbing it um, so I just want to try and see what she's doing it will be cool if she's stalking the rhino just because it'll be a nice thing to kind of show you guys a two-shot of that um, but in the meantime let's send you across to Rolf is have easier time of it than what we are. So we haven't moved anywhere because this has been such a wonderful little sighting that uh, we've decided not to go anywhere. And why would you? We have been driving around quite a lot today. Um, and between the elephants and the lions, which we had wonderful sightings of. Um, other than that, it was a little bit scarce. So having spotted this group of animals, well, we've decided just to stay put and see what happens. And this giraffe kept us thoroughly entertained. And uh, yeah, just seeing what these oryx are going to get up to. They're probably going to just try and get onto the leeward side of some of these bushes. The wind is starting to drop a little bit, although we do seem to jinx it every time we say that, it uh, blows again. So hoping that the wind dies down, not only for our sake, but for the animals as well, especially the small little antelope and the youngsters that you might see here in amongst this group of oryx, but particularly the likes of springbok. If it's cold for extended periods, they really do suffer. So they've got much thinner skin than the likes of these oryx and that's so that they can sprint. Oh, listen up, the jackals are calling. One of my favorite calls in the bush.
they're all waking up obviously for their night ahead and letting us all know it. So maybe these oryx now are going to look for shelter. Nice spot out of the wind, keep warm. We've been trying to do the same. I always think that oryx have got jodpers on. So slowly it's starting to disappear off into the bush there. As I said, looking for shelter. So I think it's time to send you also off into the bush, up to the low felt and Cedric. Thank you, Rolf. And well, we just bumped into a herd of a buffalo. A huge herd. There's quite a few of them in the background just munching away. And you can see this big male that's here in the foreground. And wow, so this is a good thing for tomorrow. But of course, I am going on leave from uh, tomorrow morning. So I'm hoping the next two that's uh, jumping onto the vehicle to replace Tristan and myself will be able to get to see these buffaloes and maybe they are going to be luring some lions in onto Juma tonight. You never know. I always say, rule of thumb, you get these herds of buffalo coming onto your property or onto the property, you're going to might have some uh, lions following them. So yes, it is something to look forward to. And it's a big herd. Wow. It sounds like we're in the pitch darkness because we've got the infrared on so it's just pitch darkness out there but it's like the bush is alive the rustling of the leaves and the crunching of the grass oh. this is it's a sound of music the bush alive the sound of music I think so yeah. Hmm. It is a sound of music, uh, Nadine. The bush is alive. Oh, it's the sound of music. So the trees are, the trees sound alive. Hmm. The sound of music. Okay. Actually, I haven't heard that. Interesting. I'd like to Google that one. Thank you. Oh, the yells. <laughs> the yells are alive. From the movie Sound of Music. Thank you, Nadine. Very interesting. Thanks for that fact for the evening. So, Nadine, our director, is giving me some updates on some music uh, or movie choices. Thank you so much, Annalie. Yes, I'm uh, looking forward to this leave thoroughly and I'm going to have a good time with family and friends. Thank you so much, Annalie. But as always, I do, I'm going to miss uh, the bush you know, for the first few days. Just relax and then I'm going to feel that oh, I want to get back again. So, but it's alright. I will be watching Wild Earth every single day. Catching up on all the characters and what's happening around him. All the knowledge from all the guides. And of course, the brilliant camera work from the cam ops. Exactly. Not everyone gets excited to hear a leopard chuff, spot a pangolin, or see a real impala rut. Join the Explorers Club and you will also enjoy the many benefits that come with it too. Wild with Explorers, it's in your nature.
Well, looks like we've got a little bit of a problem getting back to camp. As you see, these buffaloes are pretty much uh, taking over this uh, road that leads back to camp. And there's so many. I'm just listening. To you. There's, like, there's a lot of uh, watla 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 happening here behind. I know that uh, Paul is just watching behind him. Um, because it's, uh, it's totally dark here, so we just have to rely on uh, the infrared and the little monitor. Melanie, yes, it is lovely to see buffalo as a sight, and uh, there's an update on exactly where they are. So there's a buffalo coming behind me there. Uh, with on Zoe's and it looks like they're heading directly towards uh, the big open clearing that's south of our camp so I wonder if they're not going to go and settle down there and that is their general direction so there's some in front of us some behind some next to us we are in the middle You can see some coming through. Usually at this time of the night you'll find they will start settling down somewhere. They won't really continue moving around at night time unless uh, they are getting or they're being pressurized by uh, some lions and then it's a different story. Um, but you know they're all very relaxed here and moving very slowly on their own time so it seems like there's no concern on the lions for now. You never know what happens during the night time. The way they're moving, maybe the Telemati breakaway pride comes south from the northern areas. They might come south. Even the black dam males might uh, move from Arethusa airstrip and might move up this side, picking up on the noise of these buffaloes. So, a lot of potential there. Kelly, <laughs> no supper for import tonight. Yes, Kelly, I think uh, that would be Paul's nightmare right there. And I think Paul actually jump off Wendy and run back to camp for dinner. By fire, by force. Yeah, by fire, by force. Yeah. There it is. By fire, by, by force. <laughs> force. <laughs> As you can see, this male just moving in front of us. Nice big horns on him, not the oldest boy. And they can see pretty well at night time. Look, they are dire animals. I mean, that's uh, moving mostly during the daytime and feeling more confident uh, at, uh, in the day. But at night time like this now, totally dark. I mean, you can see they're still moving together as a herd. But you'll find more so that they'll be c kind of closer together at night time, more like uh, um, I can say stuck to you to one another side you know and when they are moving because they don't want to really venture off too far from each other because then in case there is any source of a danger that is prowling in the area then uh, you know that those ones that breaks off on the sides and that or lags behind could be potential prey Yeah, it looks like our roadblock is slowly but surely moving off. Wonderful. And Paul is smiling. He's very happy now. He knows that uh, that road ahead is almost clear for his dinner. But yeah, I just want to take this as well, this opportunity just to thank everybody for my six weeks being in at uh, Juma. Just want to thank, thank everybody for all the amazing questions and the comments that you have sent through to me. Um, uh, it really means so much. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, it was a very exciting six weeks here on Juma, as always. Love the Sabi Sands, and this is my home. And I feel uh, just being back here every single time. And even if it's six weeks, it's it goes by so quickly 
just felt like I actually arrived the other day. Ooh. Even the female's very happy. Looks like she got pushed by another one there. Wasn't too happy about that. Zephyr, thank you so much. Yes, uh, I do appreciate it. And uh, yes, I'm, I can't wait to get back again. It's already, I haven't even left yet, and uh, I can't wait to return. So, because there's so much happening, you know, you always keep up with everything. Yeah, and it's just, it's like, a, it's like for us, it's, it's also like a soapy, you know, it's like a story. And, uh, you know, you're here for six weeks, and every day you're trying to follow up on the story and see what see what's happening and the change of the story. You know, when you leave the story, all of a sudden you feel like, oh no, you know, now I have to catch up again. So yes, really, really do enjoy it so much. Great leopard sightings, beautiful lion sightings, hyenas. Elephant sightings, buffaloes, it's just been, it's all around, always entertaining. Get ready for your daily dose of African wildlife magic. Be enchanted by the intimate moments shared by the animals as they drink, play and interact in their natural habitat. With our daily wildlife videos, you'll experience the thrill of safari adventures without ever having to leave your seat. Let the wild adventure unfold right before your eyes. AFRICAM. Always live, always wild. Yeah, so not too much happening here with us, as I say, just listening out to the nightly sounds. But the wind is playing havoc.
we can still see if we're going to hear anything. Generally when the sun does set it does give that last little gust of wind with a change in pressure and heat differences as well. And so I hope it blows itself out. What we might see on our way back, we can expect to see some of the spring hares. Um, they live in little burrows, uh, not too deep as well. So we're hoping we might spot some on the way home. Let her go and let her do her thing. Uh, sorry if the audio was a bit funny. Hopefully it's better now. Are we all good now? Yeah. We're good now, apparently. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so if you didn't catch any of that, we left Lalamba because she obviously went running off and too thick. Didn't want to follow her, didn't want to disturb her. And that's the summary um, of the entire thing. Right, so we're going slowly back towards camp. It's that time really, start cruising towards camp. Um, just kind of coming along close towards Gari Dam here, just in case little Mareeps pops out. Obviously it's being very greedy, trying to get another leopard on drive and I'm not going to even apologize for it, actually. Um, why not? It's my last drive for a while. And who knows when I'll be back to do. I, at this stage, have no the plans to be back at this stage <laughs> but we'll see what happens Barbara so it's been a pleasure to have me back well thank you it's been nice to be back I've thoroughly enjoyed my week um, it's been nice working with Cedric which is always fun obviously the whole MC um, it's always good to work with them too so it's been nice to be back and like I said I'm not sure when I'll be back I don't know what's happening the beginning of next year is, is already very busy for me I'm gonna be um, in India for almost six weeks um, doing snow leopards and tigers and Asiatic leopards so, or Indian leopards so it's going to be a, a busy start and I've got a couple trips to the sands in January so I'm not going to have much time in the beginning of the year but maybe there'll be a spot to squeeze in somewhere during the course of the year and hopefully it won't be as long as this last hiatus from Wild Earth yeah, we'll just see how it goes these days kind of trying to just manage the amount of time that I'm spending in the bush for next year Ray say all the best on the adventures and keep us posted I shall try to I'm very bad at social media so please, I, please I'm apologizing now um, <laughs> don't post half of what I do um, which is probably greatest but at the same time I when I, I figure it is like when these trips time is for people um, not really for me to just be posting on social media and ultimately while I should be posting a little bit more uh, I uh, honestly sometimes just prefer to have some downtime when I get home and try and um, just relax and get away from computers and those kind of things as and traveling as much as we do um, it's nice just to relax when you're at home we're just stopping here just to scan to see if there's any sign of that wildcat that's been hanging around this is where we had it the other day is just across this little clearing in that area there so just having and there are creatures of habit obviously and so given that it's been getting seen on the dam cam I thought I'd just give one last little scan around just to check if it's not lurking around Crazy the other day that we had a second wildcat and it wasn't even the same one. Where Cedric had that wildcat and where this one is is very far apart. Um, so that's pretty, pretty crazy. 
Um, also, some of you had tagged me in a, a thing with the dam cam that they said that there was some plastic lying under the dam cam. You'll be happy to know I went and retrieved it today. So it will be all nice and clean there now. Um, there shouldn't be any of those. I do humbly apologize for those pieces there. It's obviously just come off of something and so just quickly pick them up but it's all clean now but thank you very much for letting us know um, it's always nice when you guys tell us about those kind of things obviously we don't want any of that lying in the bush um, and it's not in a place we check all that often so it's very very grateful that you guys managed to do it anyway it is that time for us to say goodbye i hope that you have had a wonderful afternoon there seems to have been a little bit of something for everyone um, and I hope that wherever you may be you have a wonderful day and evening further um, it's a beautiful beautiful evening here so I'm hoping that it'll stay like this and Tessa and Trish will have a good time there's buffalo crossing in hopefully we'll bring some luck but anyway goodbye for now this program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses Viewer discretion is advised.